please bear with me, everyone, because I have a cultural welcome to do tonight. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners of the land, the Bidjigal Wiggle people, and pay respects to our elders, both past and present, and to those young emerging who will one day be our leaders. To all councils here tonight, I welcome you all to our land. We are on Eora country, and I pay my respects to you also, and to your family as well. Welcome to Aboriginal Australia, the oldest people with the oldest culture of the oldest land. We are proud race of proud race of people who are older than the pyramids, some 4,500 years, older than the Stonehenge, 5,000 years, older than the Great Silk Road. The Bundyan Way is older than all three put together. It's a sacred, dreamy track. Welcome to our lands with many bush tuckers, freshwater, saltwater foods, water holes, and traditional medicines, and a colorful landscape painted by artist Albert Namijera with a multitude of cultural and traditional languages, 250 just to name a few. Therefore, English is the second, third, and fourth language to us. We had, and still have to this day, the world's oldest man-made technology, the Brie Warren of fish traps, estimated to be over 40,000 years. First explorers, Aboriginal men, women, and children, crossed the Blue Mountains, deserts, plains, and living off the land. Australia was circumnavigated by Aboriginal men, women, and children sailing in bark canoes, cut and fashioned from the sides of tall trees using stone axes to fish in and cook in too. Children were taught cultural beliefs, respect, and to value the kinship structure with having the greatest sense of identity. Our men are the hunters, lawmakers, warriors, the right to initiate, while our women who is the matriarch, mother of all the children, the nurturer, the storyteller, the gatherer. It was apparent that Aboriginal women had a unique position in their society and was highly respected. Our spirituality and totems define people's roles and responsibilities, linking their relationships and creation back to the dream time. We were uh, in, the be in the beginning of knowledge, my apology to you. We are never lost race of people and we're never terra nullius. My ancestors stood on both sides of Botany Bay when the tall ships entered into Botany Bay. These were great men and women of great integrity. The young emerging youth of today will be our tomorrow's leaders. Our ancestors of yesteryear and today lived and still live in perfect harmony with the land and manage in a pristine way of life and its environment what is looked after. Where this is still continued throughout Australia widely today. Remember all here tonight, we as a proud race of people never ceded sovereignty in our land, Australia, and Aboriginal, and your history, white Australia, as a black history. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, so, councillors, can I have um, apologies or granting of leave of absence or lateness? Councillor Bowen. Councillor Bowen for lateness. Yeah. Right. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Stravinas moved it, and Councillor Luxford has a seconder. All those in favour? Aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Can I have someone, a mover and a seconder, to confirm the minutes of the previous Ordinary Council on I'll the move 26th it, Mr. of May 2020? Uh, move moved it. by Councillor Sabrinos, seconded by Councillor Andrews. And could I also have a mover and a seconder for the Extraordinary Council meeting on the 9th of June 2020? Councillor Hamilton's moved it and seconded by Councillor Shuri. Uh, is there any declarations of pecuniary, non-pecuniary interests? Council Councillor Hamilton. <laughs> Councillor Matson, I'll go around the room. So, Councillor Hamilton. Oh, it's I just want to declare a um, significant non-pecuniary interest for CP... 
CP1720. Uh, I am on the East of Sydney City Planning Panel. I won't be present for the debate and I won't be voting on the matter. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Um, Non-significant, non-pecuniary on um, CS2420. Um, I'm a member of the Friends of Malabar Headland. Thank you. Any other? Councillor Matson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I also declare a um, significant non-pecuniary interest in CP70 of 70, 17 of 70, as I am also a community rep on the Eastern Sydney Planning Panel. And I too will be taking no part in the debate or further, anything further. Any other councillors? Uh, yeah, I, I too a uh, significant non pecuniary interest in CP17, uh, Little Bay Cove. I'm the alternate, and I'll, I'll be absenting myself just in case I'm needed on the, on the planning panel. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Any further? Thank you, councillors. Um, I'll just read out the privacy warning for the speakers tonight. In respect to Privacy and Personal Information Protection Act, members of the public are advised that the proceedings of this meeting will be recorded for the purposes of Clause 5.20-5.23 of the Council's Code of Meeting Practice. Audio, video, recording of meetings prohibited within, without permission. A person may be expelled from the meeting for using or having used an audio, video recorder without express authority of the Council. Uh, for the speakers tonight, I'd just like to say that all members of the public addressing tonight's meeting have a maximum of three minutes in which to put forward their case. Presenters will be stopped at three minutes. When it's expired, you may be granted a further minute. Councillors may ask questions at, of the presenters at the end of each submission. So... Excuse me, Mr Mayor, can I move a procedural motion? Sure, Councillor um, That The motion um, for... Uh, NM42 and 20 and MM43 and 20 are combined. I've spoken to councillors Luxford and Parker and they're um, in agreement as they're very, very similar. And that's just so that the speaker knows that he's speaking to... There are two motions which are, which are in fact the same. Yep. Thank you. Do you need a... Okay. Can I have a seconder to the procedural motion, please? Seconded. Yes, seconded. So we'll now move on to the first speaker, which is 305 307 Anzac Parade, Kingsford, for is Danny Mann. You have three minutes, Mr. Mann. Thank you, councillors, for the opportunity to address this meeting on the vertical garden with integrated digital sign. So um, I just wanted to mention that I'm from Whitehall Property, the applicant, and uh, been working with the project team to um, develop what is a bespoke opportunity to revitalise Kingsford Town Centre. And um, I'm here to speak in favour of this application. So. Tonight, uh, following the agenda, I just wanted to talk through why it is that the public benefit needs to be addressed and where that comes from. So the application needs to comply with SEP 64, in particular the guidelines, and um, there's, certain, uh, there's certain parts of that which deal with what is an appropriate public benefit. So I'd like to just talk through that. Then um, the, the application has been uh, submitted with a planning agreement and I just wanted to go through that tonight and then uh, review the outcomes of the community consultation and then any questions that you, got, you might have, I'd be uh, happy to speak to them. Also, um, some of the project team are here as well if, uh, if needed. Next slide. So the planning agreement uh, is a requirement on SEP 64. SEP 64 has an overview and a framework as to what that uh, might contain. The three key elements that the guidelines talk to is either an upfront or annual fee payment to council for the duration of consent, which is generally 15 years. Second, 
the applicant can put forward a proposal to undertake works to improve the public domain within or adjacent to the transport corridors, such as landscaping, graffiti management, or safety lighting. Third, uh, if appropriate, the applicant can provide free advertising time to promote a service, tourism in the locality, and community information. Next slide. So the proposal put, put forward in the planning agreement submitted with the DA is one, $20,000 annual fee to Randwick Council for 15 years. Two, installation and ongoing maintenance of the green wall, including its removal and make good on the exp expiration of the development consent. Three, annual allocation of media time at no cost to Kingsford Chamber of Commerce and its members. Four, high-speed Wi-Fi for Kingsford Town Centre, including coverage to the new Meek Street Plaza. Next slide. So the uh, site is located uh, at 305 Anzac Parade. Uh, this is an image traveling northbound. It's been a blank wall which uh, has been in existence since 2009. I would have thought that uh, it wasn't uh, envisaged that it would maintain in such, uh, in such dominant uh, position, but it has, and this opportunity looks to revitalise King Kingsford Town Centre by utilising that idle asset. Oh, Mr. Mayor, that's, that's the three minutes, but you've got an extra minute. Yep, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So next slide. So we've got uh, here uh, an excerpt from the planting strategy. Uh, Jungle Fire, who are here tonight, who uh, you guys might have uh, seen their project at One Central Park. In fact, they spoke to council in 2017 at a symposium in this room and um, they uh, have developed some innovative solutions for uh, the, the green wall, and uh, it's important to note that the sign is, uh, is on that wall, but it's a very small component of that wall. Next slide, please. So here you have um, a, a photo montage, and uh, it's, it's uh, overhanging 307 uh, Anzac Parade, and that landowner has agreed to have that sitting above the roof of their property. It's important to note that the light rail has removed some landscape median strips and reduced the footpath width, so this proposal offsets that loss and will add a lot of value to the town centre. So moving, moving forward, um, it's, it's important to, to look at the road safety and amenity conditions, which have been thoroughly looked at and will be before the planning panel uh, next month. It's important to note that on road safety, Transport for New South Wales, who are the road authority, have provided their concurrence and uh, it, it wasn't a straightforward process in obtaining that concurrence and they looked at road safety and provided a set of conditions which the sign will need to operate to satisfy road safety concerns. This screen will only be operational until 10 p.m. and uh, that will protect the current and future residential amenity of the town centre. The maintenance of the vegetation in the green wall will be funded from the income of the sign and a plan of management accompanies the DA which will form part of a condition. Um, the, excuse me, Mr. Mann, is that? It's a bit over, yeah. Yeah, is that about to wrap up or? Yeah, if we can just slide through and we can go to, straight to questions. So there's various environmental benefits. Uh, it's been looked at, please continue. This is uh, concepts for the media, which uh, look at activating the Meek Street Plaza. Uh, the Innovation Hub's one of them. And the, and the Wi-Fi, it's high-speed Wi-Fi, uh, in, including coverage to Meek Street Plaza. So um, various community consultations been undertaken. We've worked with the Kingsford Chamber of Commerce to come up with a solution. Um, and we can uh, go to questions uh, if anyone has any. Any questions for Mr. Mayor? Councillor Roberts? Every time I drive on that road, I see that wall and I get very frustrated because it's the most ugliest thing, I think, in, in Ramwick City. So uh, I think um, more of a comment than a question, but uh, I certainly um, am looking at this with great interest. So thank, thank you. you. Councillor Andrews. What happens when next door gets developed? So there's, in, the, in the landowner agreements, there's a demolition clause which gives the landowner rights to uh, effectively cancel the lease and uh, can develop whichever they like. So it does not hinder the attainment of the desired future character or the maximum development potential of that land. Uh, 
related to demolition. So, so if, if it next was door is, if next door is developed, obviously this agreement comes to an end. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Uh, Councillor Beach. Oh, thank you. Um, I just had a question about the, the residents who live on, in the block of units on the corner of Borrowdale Road and Anzac Parade, because yep. some of those units face uh, north towards Borrowdale Road, towards the, the building. Um, look, the green wall and the ad, the ad, you know, looks like quite a reasonable proposal. I'm just concerned about the amenity of those residents who may be facing directly into a brightly lit uh, sign, even if yep. you're just sitting down having dinner or something like that, or watching TV with your family. I'm just a bit worried that that might be a bit distracting. I mean, yeah, I understand. how many units are directly impacted? So uh, what that? I do know is that the DA was uh, publicly exhibited and uh, none of those residents uh, responded. Also that there's a, an Australian standard, the AS4282, for the outdoor obtrusive impacts of lighting and this sign complies with that. It's also got uh, a prescribed limit on luminance, which is a, a reduction on what the guidelines actually say, just to be ultra conservative in relation to the lighting. And the screen will turn off at 10 p.m. every night, which also looks at how to accommodate uh, those residential impacts that you're sp speaking of. Um, may I ask a follow-up question? Um, thank you. And you just gave some examples of some of the the type of advertisement. Will they be a series of, of still images or yes. will it be moving images? Yes. So the RMS have come up with prescribed guidelines and they will form part of the conditions of consent. And that is for static images, no motion, changing every 30 seconds or no less than every 30 seconds. So for a driver travelling down Anzac Parade, they're likely to see a maximum of one change in image based on the speed limit of that road. So um, to answer your question, uh, the, there is no motion or animation permitted or flashing or there's a series of uh, conditions of consent that the RMS now transport have prescribed and that is consistent with all other outdoor media in, in Sydney and New South Wales. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate it. So now we move on to CP 17 slash 20, Little Bay Cove planning proposal. Um, we'll start with against, which is Mr. Matthew Lennartz. I just have to, um, just have to wait till the councillors leave the Thank you, Mr. Lennartz. You ready? You have three minutes and then an extension. Yeah, yeah, that's thank okay. You. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, councillors. Thank you for your time this evening. My name's Matthew Lennartz. I'm the Executive Manager of Planning and Government at the Marathon Group. I know this outcome of this evening will be inevitable, but we'll just be quick and to the point. No matter what the current views are, the process requires consideration as to whether the proposal has strategic planning merit and that site-specific issues are identified and their scope, and there is a scope to address these should the proposal proceed. As maintained throughout the documentation, the existing approval is decades old and does not align with current strategic planning principles. The planning proposal before Council is consistent with the key principles and considerations of the Sydney Regional Plan, City East District Plan, Local Strategic Planning Strategy and Housing Strategy. On all accounts, despite the council assessment and recommendation, there is a justifiable and rational planning grounds that supports our proposal, and this can be a catalyst for broader urban renewal in the area. Nowhere is this more apparent than the recognition of the adjoining government site under the LSPS housing strategy for major urban renewal. It is, the GLAC site is currently occupied by four to 500 dwellings and has the same characteristics as our site, but the, but the same benefit is not afforded to Meriden's site. The council states it is not rely on this site to meet its housing supply targets, 
Under the housing strategy, Randwick LDA requires 14,600 dwellings by 2036. To achieve this, the LGA requires an average housing supply of 860 dwellings per annum, according to its own assessment. According to the Department of Planning Housing Monitor, only 304 dwellings have been constructed in the LGA for the 12 months to December 2019, 65% short of where it needs to be. And at this rate, it would take almost 50 years to achieve these 20-year targets. Over the past four years, Council has averaged 363 dwellings per annum of completions during the biggest housing boom in Australia's history, and it needs to increase this supply by 137% per annum. As housing construction is a key economic recovery for the current crisis and the proposal is consistent with the locational criteria set out in the LSPS, certain and committed developments should be supported. Other identified areas for growth are affected by many factors that will constrain delivery, whether it's finance, willingness, capacity, market, or lot consolidation, etc., which may further constrain housing supply despite Council's intentions. However, they, notify, they do not affect the subject site. Importantly, at this time, the proposal has the capacity to generate over 7,800 jobs based on the recent information from the National Housing Finance Investment Corporation of generating nine jobs per $1 million spent on residential construction. We all also estimate around 600 ongoing jobs. For the site-specific issues, whether it is design, traffic, heritage or environment, the scope has been set for additional assessment and all issues are capable of being addressed. In particular, despite Council's oh, pessimism, Excuse me, Mr. Um, Leonard, it's, it's, that's the three minutes, but you get an extra minute. Oh, my God. Dis um, in particular, despite Council's independent assessment on traffic, which we have not seen, Transport for New South Wales supports proposals proceeding through the gateway and the issues raised are resolvable. On design, the design panel supports the site strategy. Subject to further consideration, there's no objection from adjoining government landowners. On heritage issues, these are resolved, and importantly, we have protected, resolvable, and importantly, we protect and conserve the 2012 AUGA site, despite the misleading statements in the report. In summary, it is clear that the proposal can, can align with strategic planning considerations. We are consistent with the locational criteria established in the LSPS and housing strategy. It is clearly de it is demonstrated on available evidence that the further development is required to achieve Council's own targets set out in its own strategies. All site-specific issues, whether design, traffic, heritage or environment, are capable of being addressed and the scope for further assessment is already set out. Accordingly, there is sufficient, plan it's sufficient planning merit for the proposal to proceed under relevant considerations. Excuse me, Mr. Lennart, is it nearly about to wrap up? One more. Okay. Importantly, this will allow the issues to be resolved and allow a proper and informed public exhibition process to occur in accordance with the respective legislation and guidelines. Not releasing information as we go, but a proper process in accordance with the guidelines which Meriton will actively engage in. I know firsthand that there are people in this community that support the intent of the proposal, but they don't feel comfortable in presenting this view as there are no platforms for this to occur. This council knows well that the planned exhibition at the appropriate stage can provide a more credible outcome, like at K2K where widespread support was demonstrated when council conducted an independent survey, which was completely opposite to the written submissions. We don't disagree that there'll be varying views on these matters and there is more work to do, but it's undeniable that this site and surrounding area sits within one of the most significant strategic areas in Sydney and in a local government area blessed with access to jobs, services and amenity, which is why it is the right um, area Mr. to create a form. Sorry, before you keep turning the page, is, is that... And this is it. Okay. Yep, which is, which is why it is the right area to create affordable opportunities for people to live closer to where they work, which is identified by council as a key issue for the area and its key workers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, and speaking for is Mr. Anthony Gould. Oh, sorry, questions for Mr. Lennart. Uh, Mr. Lennart, so I'm just looking at the council report here. I don't know if you've got it in front of you, page 65, but it discusses the p possibilities of future mass trans transport to this area. 
if, if you've got it there, I'm looking at the bottom paragraph. But no. look, I, I'll just go straight to my question. What, what it says is that all Meriton states that all plans identify a future metro station at Malabar, which would inevitably be located under the jail site. So I just want to ask you a couple of questions about mm -hmm. that. First of all, metro meaning underground, is that correct? Yes. Uh, second of all, connecting from the, that would be a branch line from the Alexandria Waterloo stop, is yeah, that? Yeah, the current line I think goes from Central as an ah. extension to Sydney Metro West and then find its way down towards Alexandria, River Junction, right. Malabar, as not identified on the, count, on the government plans. And the third question is, um, so uh, it says transport for New South Wales have identified this as a long-term transport initiative. Now, as you know, we've had light rail uh, mm -hmm. coming into the area. If that's the understanding of Meriton, what, what sort of time frame have Transport for New South Wales indicated um, that this metro line might be coming this way? The metro line is identified as a long-term uh, objective, as, as you mentioned. Yep. The way that we've dealt with it and the way that we've proceeded is to deal without the reliance on that and we've always stated that and we've got support from Transport for New South Wales to proceed through the proposal. So just if I understand that, but my question was, is, is there an understanding of time frame on that long term? Same as what's sitting in the documents of the government and whether it gets changed, we know that there's a South East Sydney transport study that's sitting there all but complete and about to be released, maybe that will change it. Right. But can you, I mean, if you can't, that's fine, but I'm just, how many years, what does long term mean? Do, do you have an, if you don't have an understanding of what that might mean, I, I understand. Do I think it's a 10 to 20 year investigation, whatever okay. it is in the plan, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. So now we'll have speaking for Mr Anthony Gould. Right, um, I, I'm actually speaking against and he's speaking for just um, the guy Oh, is it? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, councillors, for listening to us tonight. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. All right, I wanted to start with what you might consider an unusual move by commending Meriton on bold speculative business. When they purchased this appropriately zoned land in 2017, there was some potential to create merit for an expansion on the original master plan's density limits. Taking a gamble is not a bad practice in business. Taking sensible risk has been the key to Mr. Triggerboff's fortune. However, unluckily for Meriton, the gamble has not paid off. The light rail will not come here. The Malabar Metro is on a back shelf until other metro projects are completed. The jail is unlikely to move anywhere. The Greater Sydney Commission has highlighted the western suburbs as a future of Sydney's jobs and growth. Apartment sales are plummeting as many high rises sit empty. Rob Stokes said Sydney needs more medium density housing. And Rob Stokes said that this project does not have merit for COVID-19 fast tracking. Meriton has run out of future merit for this site. Not a single thing has changed since the master plan was developed that would allow an increase in size on this lot. Infrastructure is the same for the foreseeable future. Meriton's gamble has not paid off. This happens in business, taking risks and some of them not going your way is how you get ahead, but you don't win every battle. But Meriton need to be told in no uncertain terms that their risk has not paid off. There is no room to budge on the original master plan decision regarding this site, and they need to build the master plan and give the community what they have paid for. Any thought of increasing the dwelling number is not supported by anything. The ludicrous number of dwellings they are asking for has created a groundswell of resentment towards Meriton, not just in Little Bay, but throughout Sydney, through the various publications that have labelled this proposal obscene. It's over seven times the dwellings, people and traffic as the original master plan. 
the wonderful community of Little Bay, the 10,500 plus signatories against this, the 2,000 plus followers of Save Little Bay need certainty. Meriton's speculation is a failed venture and the longer they carry on this angle, the more it harms both us and them. In the words of Kenny Rogers, know when to hold them, know when to fold them. It's time for Meriton to walk away from their rezoning plans. The dealing's done. Thank you. Oh, did, did the slides not come up? Oh. That's okay. <laughs> what I might do is, do you mind taking questions and then if they do come up, we'll get, still go through the slides. Is okay, that sure. Okay? Yeah. So, any questions for Mr. Gould? D'Souza? So, Mr. Gould, if you could summarise it into one or two lines, you would say basically this whole proposal isn't need, it's greed that motivates this particular group. Would you share that view? I, I, I think that's a very accurate view that they're not trying to need, do anything. Need, I mean, this proposal isn't a need. You talked about Rob Stokes, a friend, medium density living, etc. So that, that clarifies it, that it's greed that motivates. The other thing which comes to mind is infrastructure. The infrastructure, would you share my view, and I'm open to yours, that the infrastructure doesn't exist and the plan that's being proposed will leave this area in great need for more infrastructure. I mean, later on, we're going to have a great, the great train drivers and the bus union speak to protect our community and the drivers. And what will become obvious is that these kind of proposals firstly, can't be entertained, and secondly, it confirms that the infrastructure we had has to be protected. Would you share that? Yes, that's uh, extremely accurate. This is, um, this is the end of a peninsula. You can't just put all the housing here. You need it further down. Otherwise, this creates a mess all the way up. Thank you, Mr Gould. I'll certainly take in those points into that debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor de Rocha. Um, would you say that money can't buy everything? I, th I think that's very accurate, yes. And um, would you say that in a case like this, where Meriton, you know, comes around flashing the money and say that the only way is up, we say, you'd say, no, the only way is protecting our natural environment? Yeah, protect the natural environment, protect the community. The community comes first. Thank you. Um, so what we'll do is, yeah, if you can just flick through them and we'll, we'll do it that way. Yeah, sure. Um, well, so that's the original master plan. These are just some um, visuals that I've done up uh, just to compare the original site uh, with what Meriton is proposal. On the top is uh, the original um, plan and down the bottom is what they're proposing. As you can see, it's quite a lot larger. Um, you could probably quick flick through quite quickly. Uh, as you can see, the visual impact of having these apartments here will be visible all over the coast. Um, it blocks the views of all these apartments that have already built, built, been built here with that um, community plan in place and with the idea that they would have coastal views. Uh, as you can see, there's less parkland in this new proposal they've removed. Um, that park, which a lot of the community use, uh, it's uh, a children's playgrounds there and there's a lot less green space in this new proposal. Uh, it, and if this is just standing on Gallop Street and you can see that it's, uh, it's just overshadowing everything. Uh, and this is the LOP of the area, you can see that the subject site is already the tallest in the region and 
uh, up to 15 to 18 metres. Uh, what they're proposing of about 65 metres is just not on scale with the entire site. Um, and that's just reiterating what I said in my talk, that we have a lot of support against this. And the reason why um, this has been so objected to by the community is just because it, it is so much. Um, thank you, councillors. Thank you, Mr Gould. And sorry about the delay, but That's all right. we got it up there. So next, councillors, we have NM41-20, notice the motion from Councillor D'Souza, acknowledging and supporting the Aboriginal community. Um, and we have Arnie Barb to speak. Is someone... Oh, and Councillor Nielsen, can you tell the other councillors they can come back in now? <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. No, it's hopeless, isn't it? So that's his motion. Just wait a minute because the other councillors yeah. have to come in. Yep. Thank you, Anna Barb. Thank you. you can start when you're ready. I would like to have heard what was said. I was outside and didn't hear anything, so I've got to acknowledge this, Noel. Is that right? Can I talk on it or anything? You've got three minutes to I'll speak try. on okay. it. Okay. Well, and then an extra quick. minute afterwards. I'd like to acknowledge that Aboriginal people are not really treated equally by, I'll be very blunt, by Rangmi Council. Um, two councillors, I've got to say, are really passionate with Aboriginal people. Noel D'Souza and Carlos de Rocha are very passionate with Aboriginal people and partner us in what we do. We are a sovereign people in Australia and in Ramwick Council's local government area. I am a child of the Stolen Generation, taken away in 1956. Simple reason, our mother had a heart attack. We were charged with neglect before the courts and separated. I was lucky enough to be in Canberra when former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said sorry and he apologised to the Stolen Generation members and to Australia where other Prime Ministers couldn't see fit to do it. I was also appalled when I went down to the museum last week and very poorly our communities represented there. Sims family also were artefact makers, storytellers, history and cultured people, and nothing is in that museum about them. We have a tiny little monument that sits over Timbury Cove, and when we look at the French Museum and the monuments, it says something who we are, so we are neglected. So I hope Council can look at this and address it in a positive way, in an holistic way. Please look at it, because we do count, and black lives do matter, very, very much so. As late as three weeks ago, one of our Aboriginal women was locked in the back of a paddy, paddy wagon, quarter to three in the morning. Not for any fault of her own. She wasn't allowed to sit on the back seat of the van. They put her in the paddy wagon. The lady has poor eyesight, 84. So imagine your mother or grandmother being locked in a van. How would you feel? So I took that case up for her. We had our last meeting yesterday with the police from Aroubra and the local area commander. We met outside here. So our people really need to be respected, to be valued, and to be looked at as your equal. I'd like to think of these councillors as my equal. I even saw a councillor on television, I think it was last week, where Black Lives Matter, where a policeman got assaulted, or some police officers. What about the young Aboriginal boy that got his feet taken from under him? That family comes from La Perouse. They're my family. So those lives matter as well. And I really watched intently by the councillor. I'm looking at the councillor now as well. So our lives do matter. Our kids' lives matter. Our elders matter. 
it's about time council done something about it. Our history is very poor at La Perouse. Everything is French and cook, and we're just celebrating, or we're not celebrating actually, 250 years of Cook's encounter. He didn't discover Australia. We weren't lost to be discovered. We were always here. We were never terra nullius. We're not a lost race. We are a proud race and we stand tall. I myself must respect my elders, both past and present, and I look always at the young emerging. Noel, I honour what you do for our community. Carlos, you as well. I honour what you do. And I pay my respects to both of you. You are welcome always in our community as well as everyone else here. If you only took the time to come and talk to us, we can show you, we can do. And I know Danny, you're looking at me, so oh, I would no, like to no, endorse- you've got an extra minute there. I would like to endorse know. what you say, Noel, and what you put in here. But please think about who we are. This council in its all its history has never ever had an Aboriginal person, male or female, on council. And it's not lack of wanting to try, it's council should be in, encouraging, endorsing us. I'll go back to two councillors again they, they, who do encourage you. So think about trying to get an Aboriginal person on council for Israel's views, and you'd be surprised what we can add to this council. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen thank you very much for listening to me, and I'll sit back outside. Noel, oh, thank you so Barb, very much. If you, like, if you don't mind, do you mind taking questions from... Yes, I would, Councilor, please. Councillor Shirut. Hi, uh, hi, Auntie Barb. Are you saying that this 84-year-old lady was locked in the back of the paddy wagon was in, Mar in Maroubra? Yes, her grandson came home. They said he breached his curfew. He was at the gate at before 12 o'clock at La Perouse Mission, what we call the mission. Yeah. The police are in that mission nearly three to four times a day, every day, every week. Then, Ani Marge had to go into the police station. That same lady, was a state wicket keeper and Vigoro player for New South Wales. The same lady had to get permission to represent New South Wales in Cricko, like men's cricket, only faster, from the manager of our mission, put there by the New South Wales welfare and the government. That lady couldn't sit on the seat. There were papers on the seat. I took the case up for her. I'd been to three meetings with police. Three police officers were there they couldn't move the papers, they put it in the back of the van. She couldn't even get up to step up to it. 84, quarter to three in the morning. How does one feel? She was so embarrassed if anyone had seen her and what they'd done to her. She had nothing to hold on to her. And I said to the police, you're lucky she didn't fall and hit her head and die. You'd have had a death in custody. I'd had calls from the Aboriginal Legal Service. Radio stations had rang me. Kuri Radio rang me, they wanted to take the case up. One politician came out, coming out, David Shoebridge. He took interest in it. So I say, when you get on t television, councillors, think about black lives as well. I do feel for the policemen, that police officers that were assaulted, there's no need for that, no need at all. They are there to serve the community and to uphold the law. I myself have a great friend who's a policeman, Detective Sergeant and the area commander, him and I are really good friends. So stop and think about the lives that are affected. And that young, young boy in, in Surrey Hills, there was no need for that. I'm glad he was videoed that day. So across the world, people are marching and talking. And they're talking about black lives, how they matter. Everyday life matters to us. We were governed by a white bureaucracy, we were governed by a manager. Police patrolled the missions. Police listened under our house for our conversations and reported back to the manager. So try living with some of those things. Try see what it's like being taken away by the police and being sexually abused. I was by white girls in a bathtub, four of them. I live with that every day of my life. Today I'm 72 and that hurt and pain will never go away for me. We went and visited our mother in hospital she was on the floor on a mattress, white women in beds. What's it say? It'll never change. We have lots of unfinished business. And it's about time we look at that. Thank and you, our, Auntie Just one more thing, just okay. very quickly. Our Prime Minister made a statement in Canberra. There was no slavery. My word, there was. There was slavery. 
our men were chained around the necks to each other. My father was one of those. His meals were put on a tin plate, put out the door where the dog comes in. After serving 15 years of his life in Bomadary, taken away from La Perouse Mission in 1912 when his mother died in childbirth, he was removed that night, 12 o'clock. He went from there to a place at Moree called Gurley, a railway siding, a slave. So these things did happen. If we want to move forward, let's also address backwards to make us a better place today and to live in a better and just society. I'm asking you, each and every one of you here, please take it on board and heed to it. And to my two councillor friends, I thank you so very much. Thank you. Hey, Bob, do you want to just sit inside? Just no, I like the questions, yes, Danny. Pardon? Does anyone want to ask any oh, more any questions? Any further questions? And if I've sounded blunt, I do apologise. No, that's fine. Oh, I that's just me. To say, do you want to sit inside rather than go back outside? Because what I might do is not have a break yeah. and continue on. So if you'd like to sit inside, there's empty well, chairs here. I have a here friend now. with me. I'd like to bring her in with me. Okay, that's fine. There's a few empty chairs now. So now we move on to NM43-20. Notice the motion from Councillor Luxford and Councillor Parker and now Councillor Shuri on the bus privatisation of Region 9 with Mr Daniel Jaggers. So you have three minutes and an extension of a minute, Mr Jaggers. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, councillors, for having me here this evening. Uh, the RTBU is the uh, union that represents the tram and the bus drivers. Our members are proud of the work they do as public sector employees and proud of the service they provide to the local community, your community. Late last year, the Barrow Chickalian government announced plans that they would move to privatise the last remaining public bus routes in Sydney, that being Region 7, 8 and Region 9, which brings in Ranwick and other suburbs throughout the eastern suburbs. Let us be clear, this was despite a promise in the lead up to the last New South Wales election from the Premier herself that no further publicly owned services would be privatised. Since the announcement, we have kicked off a community campaign working with union members, allies and concerned community members, demonstrating the clear community consensus that we are opposed to the privatisation of our public services, particularly our public transport network. We know that, it's, if that, we know, we know that if this goes ahead, we do not know what will be privatised next. Let us spend some time talking about what privatised or franchised services and what this mean for members, will mean for members of your community. In Region 6 and in Newcastle, it was claimed that the privatisation, franchisation of these services would save public transport and create a world-class service. The handover was a disaster. Buses either ran late or did not show up at all. Routes and services were, were cut. This experiment in franchising did not work. Opal data has revealed a decrease in the patronage of 2% and on-time running plummeted from 87% down to 52%. Let us be clear about the differences between public and private services. When services are run by private corporations, decisions are made to benefit the corporation, not the community who need this. Their purpose is making profits for the shareholders, not to get us where we need to go. The campaign was going well with thousands of commuters signing petitions, triggering debates in Parliament. As part of this work, we have built an online community of tens upon thousands of supporters around the state. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we suddenly saw the government deem the work of public transport employees as essential. Our members were on the front line moving those workers and community members that needed to travel where they needed to go, despite the risk to the health and safety of the drivers and their families. In these times, we all need some certainty. Our members need to know they have secure work and the community needs to know their bus will arrive and get them where they need to go. We are of the view in the current climate it would be imminently sensible to at least maintain the status quo. Unfortunately, the government has different ideas and during a pandemic announced to the workers and the community that they would be ploughing ahead with their privatisation experiment to the detriment of both the community and the workers alike. Workers in the community have had their voices ignored. Over 60,000 people have indicated to this government they are opposing privatisation. They believe it's a public service running the buses. We support the resolution put today. Excuse me, Mr. Jagger, you've got an extra minute. Thank, Thank you. you. We, we, we support the resolution put today as a way of making sure the voices of thousands of those commuters 
and workers are considered in this decision and that you are in gaining an explicit commitment from the government in retaining the bus routes and stops your community not only deserves but relies on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Jagger. Any questions? Yeah. Um, thank you, Danny, for addressing us tonight. Um, how many bus routes are going to be affected within our region? We're Region 9, yeah. Um, Privatisation. OK, so in the actual number, talking about the actual number of bus routes, my examples can come out of Newcastle and Newcastle only. I, I cannot see what the government has put forward as a, a master transport plan for the eastern suburbs, other than they've just indicated put in a new light rail. And that, I dare say, will run in conjunction with bus services being fed to that light rail service to get the, com to get the commuters to get off the bus and get onto the light rail, which, unfortunately, at the moment, is not uh, having a great patronage. Um, when I talk about Newcastle services, I can talk from the experience of dealing with uh, the, uh, the private operator where they reduced the services of the 41, 43 and 48 routes and it was an hourly service, reduced down to a two hourly service and once you start reducing the services, all of a sudden you, you have the data that tells you nobody no longer, no longer catches those services so it then justifies why the private operator can actually get rid of a service and say quite clearly to uh, transport for New South Wales, oh, let's put these buses elsewhere on a main corridor route and let's not actually provide a service anymore, but let's just provide it as public transport, which obviously in the end makes more um, dollars for the, uh, for the um, contractor. I've got one more. And how many em employees um, out of our Ramwick bus depot is this going to affect? Oh, look, at Ram so, so the Ram it's not only the Ranwick Depot, it's actually uh, Port Botany and Waverley Depot. We actually have members that uh, work at those depots and they actually live in this uh, electorate. Um, so I would probably say anywhere from uh, 500 to 1,000. Ms Parker. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, th through you, th thank you firstly for the um, contribution. Um, Am I correct in, in saying that there's been correspondence from the Secretary of Transport confirming that non-operational staff uh, will have no employment guarantees and that operational staff will only have two years? Um, that is correct and, and that's uh, a guarantee that, uh, yeah, that's been given that any operational staff will have two years and after that then the uh, private contractor can um, go ahead and uh, do what they need to do in relation if they want to um, so, so even for bus, their... for bus drivers after two years it's the Wild West? That is correct. Okay. Um, one one f follow up. Um, the experience of the Hunter region, as well as Region Six. Um, what was the experience in regards to bus stops? Um, I, I know that bus stops, especially for el and the placement of bus stops, especially for elderly people, um, can only uh, walk so far, and they need to have um, uh, bus stops uh, within a, a, a walking distance. I, th I think it's recommended for a minimum of 400 metres. I'm, I'm just curious what the experience in those two regions was. Uh, the experiences that we've got, the feedback from the community have been, obviously the elderly people and the people that are disadvantaged find it a lot more difficult to get to the buses because what they do is they remove a bus stop and by removing a bus stop it increases the, uh, uh, the sorry, decreases the running time of the route and once again, um, you know, these are things that have been fought for over the years in relation to having these stops in there for the uh, disadvantaged and certainly for our elderly residents. And it, it's, it's not, a good, not a good thing for the elderly. Uh, Councillor Roberts, you have your hand up. No, Councillor D'Souza. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Daniel or Mr Jagas, uh, you said close to 1,000 people will lose their jobs. Or what quantity, quantum figure would you say, 500? All right, what I, what I would say there's between 500 to 1,000 people that would work at those three, three, three combined depots. They're going to be, their jobs are going to be threatened. Um, as as Councillor indicated previously, those jobs are guaranteed for two years. That is part, part of any transition. Um, and that's not, that's not one of the biggest concerns. One of the biggest concerns, once a private operator does come in, is that our members' conditions are the ones that start being attacked. They start going after those conditions because ultimately, and you can't begrudge a private corporation from um, wanting to make money, our argument is that that money shouldn't be made at the, at the behest of a public service. So <coughs> people are going to lose their jobs. What hope do these people have of being 
re-employed. I mean, some of these people, that's all they know. Would you share that view? They're it's de have definitely, definitely. Uncertainty is a, is a terrible fear. Yes, it's, it's a community-shattering thing. Definitely, yeah. And, and we talk about infrastructure. Sorry, Mr Mayor, just one supplementary question. So we talk about infrastructure, and we talk about, you know, this light rail's come on board, the government built it, purpose-built light rail, but what it really has done, it, it's created angst for our community. This new privatisation, that's Thatcherism all over again, and we know what that did to our coal miners. But uh, this privatisation, what it leads to, I, and I'd ask you from your experience as a union delegate, what exactly does it do to the social fabric of a community like ours? What it does to the social fabric Thank of the community is have everybody start to race to the bottom. And our living standards start to suffer, the community starts to suffer, and uh, like, like most things, you know, uh, people just get left behind. This is a public service. It should stay in public hands. Thank you, Mr Jacker. Well yes. said. Any further questions? So these bus drivers won't be able to be a bus driver in the future. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is in relation to the two-year job guarantee, after the two-year job guarantee, there's nothing to say that their conditions that they have currently now will, will stay. So in two years' time, you're saying they won't be bus drivers? I'm not saying there won't okay. be bus drives in due years' time. I'll go back to my previous point where we should get out of this mould of racing to the bottom. Further questions? Thank you, Mr Jacobs. And sorry, just before I do go, Mayor, I, I did forget at the introduction to actually recognise one of our local bus drivers um, from the Port Botany Depot has come here this evening on his annual day just to uh, he, 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 he and um, be here this evening. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Um, Councillors, what I might do, rather than have a break, I think I'll just go straight into it. Um, pardon? Oh, CP, so we're straight into CP20, you beat me to it, Councillors, for a minute. I'll second CP15 slash 20, 305 and 307 Anzac Parade, Kingsford, so I have a mover, which is Councillor Savrinos. What, what is, excuse me, what is Councillor Savrinos moving? As per the business paper? Yes, Mr Mayor, I'll be moving the recommendation on the business paper. Okay. okay. And seconded by Councillor Roberts. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, um, thank would you. you like to speak? I will speak on it, Mr Mayor. Look, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll be supporting this report tonight. What we currently have in Kingsford is a war which offers no aesthetic value, no financial value, no environmental value, and no technological value and no benefit to the community. And what this report is doing tonight is bringing added value in all those areas to our community. What we have is a sign that will not only bring Wi-Fi to the town centre, but will give a monetary contribution of $20,000 per annum to the council, which will be directly used to, uh, to, to improve public amenity in the area there. And it will also promote local businesses uh, with the signage and it will also give us a vertical green wall, a lack of green space which we currently have in the, in, uh, in, uh, the area, then the town centre will now have a wall that will offer uh, us some sort of uh, green, green, greenery, if you want to put it that way. And this is the way that a lot of cities across the world are currently going at the moment. And I know th I note the uh, development in uh, uh, Broadway where the old Carlton United Breweries site used to be, that they have a green wall in, uh, uh, built along there, just directly opposite the, uh, the UTS uh, building there. So I think that this is a win for our community in many ways. And I'm also happy to see that uh, the free Wi-Fi that will be offered will be, will be there. And, and I can tell you there will be many people within our community who will take advantage of this. As a uh, advocate for local business, Wi-Fi, and offering free Wi-Fi in a town centre is beneficial because it actually brings people into those town centres. Now, the other point I want to raise is the fact that uh, currently we know that businesses are suffering. Businesses have suffered for the last few months as a result of the pandemic, the coronavirus. And I think that anything we can do now to try and rejuvenate our town centre 
where we've currently got a wall now that offers no value whatsoever, to now have a wall that will offer value to the community and to those businesses is what we need. And I could not express the importance of Wi-Fi in bringing people into town centres. It, it works in Europe, where, you know, when you go to the, uh, the islands, the Greek islands, or when you go to any of the town centres throughout Europe, everywhere you go, they offer free Wi-Fi, and it tends to bring people into the area. Now, the next point I want to raise is in relation to the lighting and the fact that it should be noted that the lights will be dimmed or turned off completely between the hours of 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. every day. So, uh, look, and, and then the uh, speaker here, Mr Danny Mann, when he was here earlier, he also sp spoke about AS4282, which is the prescribed limit for the aluminums and the fact that they will have to comply with these uh, stringencies. Now, I know, reading the report, that we have, uh, what, there were seven people that uh, wrote to council in relation to it, and one of them was in relation to an objection uh, relating to the heat that would be emitted from the sign. Look, I think that this is the future, especially in areas where we've got town centres, where we've got uh, larger buildings, high-rises like, well, not high-rises, but we're talking here about an eight-storey building in Kingsford. I think it's beneficial to us to have this type of uh, advertising with, vertical, with a vertical green wall being put in our city because it adds aesthetic value, it adds uh, technological value, and it adds overall value to, for the community and for the local businesses. And councillors, I would urge you all to support this motion of uh, this report tonight because I think it hits a nail on the head. Thank you. Um, I'll just go over to Councillor Roberts, a seconder. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll be supporting it as well. Uh, the, the main reason I'm supporting it is, at the moment, as I mentioned before, it's the ugliest wall in the city. It really is an eyesore. And I look at it every time I drive along it and I just think to myself that it's so ugly. And now we have an opportunity to turn that into uh, a green wall that will produce 20 grand a year for council. Um, but more importantly, and this is the critical thing that makes me want to support this, is that they're offering the space of that sign to the Chamber of Commerce for 12 weeks of the year. That's nearly a quarter of the whole year where that space can be used to promote those businesses that may not even have the financial means to, to put an ad up, uh, ad up there. So I think it's, it's fantastic. I think it strikes the right balance and, and, and worthy of support. Councillor Beach, you had your hand up first. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, I just had some questions uh, to direct to the relevant uh, officer. Um, I just wonder if this uh, report is endorsed tonight, will that in any way uh, give the planning panel some sort of tacit endorsement for the project? I, I actually, I'm not against it. I, I like the green wall. I'm not against advertising signage, but I am concerned about those residents who do live in the apartments in that block on the corner of Anzac and, uh, and Borrowdale Road that will be directly uh, facing the sign. And so at a time when they might be sitting at home having enjoying a meal in the evening, um, you know, it just might not be the most ideal circumstance to be looking directly at a brightly lit sign. So will this in some, it, it, will any decision either way tonight influence uh, a, an ultimate decision of, of the panel? And also, is there an extended opportunity for the panel to consult with residents? Because I'm just not sure that many residents will, will see public notifications um, and they just might not have had an opportunity to make a comment either for or against the proposal. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the report uh, before you tonight, councillors, is really only to consider the, the public benefit test as required under the state policy. Uh, the merits of the application in terms of its compliance with uh, council's uh, strategic planning documents and development controls will be a matter for consideration for the panel and in that they will consider a visual assessment of the proposal and its impact on, on the amenity of the locality. 
Um, so really, the only question for Council today is really only to consider whether it meets the public benefit test uh, in terms of what is put to Council um, through the planning agreement. If Council doesn't decide on that amount um, or the terms of the agreement, then that would be decided by the uh, Department of Planning. Um, on the question of the public notification, um, that has um, been undertaken now, um, so the, the panel won't be having the opportunity to consider any further submissions other than uh, the community that wants to attend the panel meeting and make further representations. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bowen. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. i just got a question. Um, I'm just looking at the DA plans, but I, I just wanted to know what are the dimensions of this screen? Like the actual screen, not the green wall. I just can't actually see it quickly off um, the schematic. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't recall exactly what the dimensions are. If you give me um, a couple of minutes, I could probably uh, find that out and allow Council to Next, then we'll come back. Um, this is a question too. Um, I was at the um, conference where uh, the gentleman, the speaker t tonight, uh, spoke about the Green Wall at One Central, and he said how expensive it was to actually maintain. Um, in fact, they have a full-time person working on that Green Wall that works every day to maintain it. Um, and, and which is paid for by the uh, strata, you know, fees that are charged, uh, very expensive strata fees that are charged in that building. And I, um, my question is to you, Mr. Keriaku, probably I don't, I don't know if you can answer this, but who will do the maintenance of that green wall? Because it, as the, the, jet, the speaker spoke at the conference saying that if the, if the maintenance is not done every day, well then that's the end of the green wall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the maintenance would be uh, encompassed within a program um, set out within the condition of the consent. So um, it would be the person that benefits from the consent, which would be um, um, the applicant that's um, also operating the signage. Council desist. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, K to K was really, really important for the people of Kensington and Kingsford. What it offered the business owners and the community was hope. It was a chance to embrace modernity. That's what it was. It, it light rail came. I wasn't in support of the light rail, but it's here now. So that's modernity. <coughs> K2K, Councillor Matson championed it. He was the gentleman who or one of the councillors who, there was a $300,000 prize that was given to some architect who, who put forward a, a very brave plan. I remember the pho my photo on the front cover of Southern Korea with a, with, a, with a space vision of the future, how we were going to make that area much more livable and successful. Now, what's being offered here fits right into the plan the futuristic plan. I don't know whether they imagined the word green lung or I heard it tonight, <clears throat> but that's exactly what this will be doing. There are people who want to put incinerators in our suburb in Matraville, which will threaten our quality of life and threaten our air quality. Here is an opportunity to improve our air quality, to decrease our carbon footprint, improve the, the aesthetic beauty of a suburb. Now, once we start, it's like all infections and other good ideas, people take it on board and they move forward on it. And can you imagine the Kingsford of today? Green again, green again. Now, they tell me that our green canopy, when it came to local government areas, Randwick was second last. 
on that list. I, I could have imagined that too, but I remember, again, the Southern Courier pointing it out. The only people worse than us was Botany. Say no more, right? But in saying that, we have an opportunity to reverse things. We have an opportunity to not only make things more beautiful, but also decrease in our carbon footprint. There should be little debate on this. I notice some green councillors stand up and express their views. If anything, this is an advertising board for their political group. Uh, they won't need to put any more posters up. The green wall will say it all. Mr Mayor, there should be little debate on this. We should support it. And I congratulate Councillor Stavrinos for speaking on the matter. Um, Councillor Bowen, just before you start, I was going to say, do we have an answer for Councillor Bowen? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the advertising the whole display area will be approximately uh, 40.9 square metres, and so the dimensions of the sign 12.4 uh, metres long by 3.29 metres high. Thank you. Um, Councillors, I won't be supporting this. Um, we just heard the dimensions and it's equivalent to a billboard uh, and I, I'd encourage you to look at page 11 which gives you a bit of the history that the, digi the original digital sign was refused by the, uh, um, or was refused, uh, I'm not sure whether that was by the planning panel or by the council or by under delegated authority but the applicant took it to the Land Environment Court and it was refused again. Uh, so I'm concerned because this is advertising uh, and I think we need to be very careful about giving our support by way of a planning agreement to advertising. Uh, planning agreements normally, I'm not saying it's um, not something the council could do, but normally a planning agreement is for something for the benefit of the community in a uh, very direct sense, rather than a more remote sense of, of a bit of money coming into the council coffers. Um, and I'm concerned about the precedent, and I am concerned that it would be relied upon at the, um, in the application to come, that if it's approved, council supports the planning agreement. So there is a, a level of, I'm not suggesting it's tacit support one way or another, but it'll be certainly articulated as a positive for this proposal uh, when it comes up for consideration. And I just don't think this is what this council should be in the business of. Um, and I've heard the arguments about uh, the businesses in the area, and I'm well aware that the businesses there have suffered uh, through the um, light rail construction, through the loss of permanent loss of parking, and of course through the latest uh, pandemic but I don't think increasing advertising is going to be, is a good thing for Kingsford. I don't think it's a good thing for our residents. And if we uh, keep in mind, uh, someone was speaking a moment ago about K2K, are we gonna have a, a forest of digital screens uh, elevate in the sky in, along Anzac Parade into the future? Because if one comes in, there'll be more. And I might add, I believe the, there's been a gross, uh, explosion of advertising uh, along that area through the light rail. It's a 70 metre moving billboard. It's uh, horrific. And we, I don't think we should be in a position of, of adding to the advertising there. It'll be on at night. Um, and I, I, I'm concerned we'll get some sort of lo Las Vegas effect. And that's not gonna help the businesses. And a lot of flashing lights and advertising, I don't believe will help businesses in that area. So. I'm not, I'm not persuaded. I think this is something we need to tread very carefully on. Um, there's other ways we can assist our businesses that are, are subtle, are in keeping with our community feel, rather than an explosion of advertising. And I'm reminded, there used to be, I think, a sign outside one of the Hoyt cinemas, which are all gone. And I, I don't think that really added to the amenity of, of, the, um, of, the, of the area. So. I don't think this is, I, I don't believe the public interest, public benefit argument is made out and I won't be supporting it. 
Councillor Singh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I want to ask a question before I speak on the substance of the motion. Uh, by the way, uh, can I start by saying that I'm in favour of the motion? Uh, my question is, Mr. Mayor, don't we already have two di digital signages in Maroubra? One is directly outside Pacific Square, and another one is on the bridge, pedestrian bridge uh, along NZ Parade in Maroubra. I've seen them, but I'll confirm it with the Director of Planning. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I think I do recall those two signs being in those locations as well. Um, Councillor Stavrinos, would you like to wrap it up this movie? Oh, no, no, hang on. I haven't finished yet. Okay. Thank you, thank you. S speaking in favour of the motion, Mr Mayor, each time I go to uh, Central Park, Sydney, that's the development across UTS that Councillor Stavrinos was, uh, was talking about earlier. I will spend a few minutes admiring the building there, the building there, the green walls, all right? And I was always asking myself that, when is Rambit going to have that? I mean, it's so beautiful, it helps our environment. And now we have, we have finally going to have a green wall in Kingsford. I consider this, it's going to create a precedent for us. I mean, this is so beautiful. So when we have a green wall in Kingsford and then we're going to have a signage there, I don't think, as, as we have been told just now, that we already got two dig digital signs in Maroubra. I, I can't see why we can't have another one in Kingsford. I will go further by saying that, Mr. Mayor, the $20,000 that we're going to get if this DA is approved should be quarantined and should be only spent to improve our uh, Kingsford town, town centre. So the residents and the business will benefit from this uh, funding, additional funding that we get. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I think this is just a waste of space, as Councillor Roberts mentioned, that it's such an ugly site. Are we going to forever allow that ugly site to be there? I mean, it's time that we do, we did something about it. I think this is, this is appropriate. Um, I really love to see green walls throughout the city of Sydney, and this is an opportunity throughout the city of Randwick. And I think this is a good opportunity to start with, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. The Singh. Um, sorry, Councillor De Rocha. We all saw the pictures that were up before of what's there now and the wall that's there now. And we've all seen what Kingsford has gone through, um, you know, with the light rail and everything that it's been in its path. Um, I think that when we had the speaker tell us about, you know, um, the advertising that was going to be on there, um, he was open, he was transparent, he spoke about what was going to happen, he answered the questions that Councillor Vitch and that had about motion and stuff like that, which would be, you know, um, really, really hard on, on the residents nearby with something that was constantly moving in front of their face. Um, he mentioned the 30 seconds where, you know, um, if you were driving your car through the area, you'd probably see one picture. Like, um, at the moment, Kingsford needs all the help that they can get. and. Um, a green wall instead of a brown wall, right? Um, I understand what you're saying, Councillor Shuri, and maybe part of the condition would be to be heavily maintained to ensure that that does, whatever the vegetation is, does prosper. I see in the building in the city, the building is all vegetation on the outside near Ultimo, and I can't believe how that thrives to, to, to where it is. Councillor Stavrino, you spoke so well on this that um, I really do think that there is no negatives here um, except a positive to say, you've gone through so much, I'm going to give you a bit of colour, right? I'm going to give you a bit of green. I'm just going to give you something else to look at instead of a crappy brown wall, right, um, as you drive past. And as um, Councillor Andrews said, if the property next door is to be developed, then that PA is void. Like, it's finished. It won't, you know, um, it stops, it seizes then. Um, Councillors, oh, I just think it's, you know, it's all a win-win for Kingsford. Uh, uh, just in closing, Mr Mayor, I've always been an advocate of small businesses and I believe that there will be many benefits in relation to uh, this sign. And um, look, I think, it, you know, with the businesses having put up with the light rail for a number of years and the pandemic, I think it's important now 
that we uh, come to the table and we do something good for our local businesses and there will be some uh, community benefits as well. So I'll just leave it at that and I'll put it to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councillors, I'll, I'll put it there. All those in favour? Aye. Say aye. Those against? No. I declare that carried. So CP17, before we start, they have to um, leave the room. Councillors have to leave. Mr Mayor, I'd like to move it. No, it was my. Oh. No, I'm just. I haven't even started yet to read it out or anything. So, CP 17 slash 20 Little Bay Co. Oh, planning it, proposal. Another mover. Uh, Councillor Parker's Parker. moving. Yeah. Councillor Luxford. Luxford is seconded. Uh, I'm moving the recommendation on the business paper, um, which is that uh, Council refuse um, Meriton's uh, application for Gateway. Um, look, in short, Mr. Mr Mayor and fellow councillors, um, the proposal uh, which we have before us is just totally unsuitable. Um, in my view, it is overdevelopment on steroids. Um, every planner that has set eyes on Meriton's high-rise gamble um, has slammed the proposal for lacking strategic merit. 17 storeys, quite simply, uh, in a sensitive coastal environment is just totally inappropriate. Uh, Meriton wants to turn uh, our little bay into a, the new CBD by the sea. Uh, we've already master planned this site with half of it built already. Um, and, and it is not necessary um, because we've already met our housing targets. Um, we've sensibly done so with community support and as such, we can reasonably leave the existing master plan in place to give residents certainty as to what the built form in their suburb will look at, uh, will look like. In short, the proposal um, asks for 1,900 uh, indicative dwellings up from 450, uh, maximum heights of 17 storeys up from five, and a pur purported floor space ratio of two to one. Um, all of this is simply uh, unsuitable for a sensitive coastal environment, which uh, both the planning uh, panel uh, and council uh, planners have identified have no significant uh, major transport links and significant heritage values. Our council staff have already stated that the proposal fails to meet the strategic merit test. It's inconsistent with the district plans proposed by the Greater Sydney Commission. It's inconsistent with our own local strategic planning statement and it's inconsistent with our housing strategy where we have already met our housing targets. I fail to see on merit grounds what, uh, what possible reason we could provide as to why this is a necessary uh, proposal at this time or at any time for that matter. It was raised in the previous um, questioning um, as to the commitment uh, by the New South Wales State Government uh, towards significant uh, transport infrastructure going anywhere near this area. And it was quite clear, uh, both from the questioning and the response, um, that there is no concrete, or for that matter, really even tentative uh, plans for mass transit um, uh, in, the, in this area. Um, they are simply lines on a map uh, which are not clearly articulated at all. And if anyone um, who is a watcher of uh, state government finances would know that in the coming uh, years, if not decades, uh, state governments will be uh, very cash-strapped and, will, in my view, will struggle to pr propose and deliver uh, the infrastructure which is already on the table, let alone uh, ones muted well into the future. Um, other issues with the planning proposal in involve... Uh, uh, unsuitable bulk and scale and massing, which are simply uh, out of proportion and unreasonable for the area. Uh, the visual impacts will be significant, as well as shadowing on nearby uh, areas, as well as fa failing to properly consider the impact on the sensitive uh, nearby banks here. So this proposal, in my view, has no friends, uh, because it has no justification. I've talked to uh, countless uh, residents about this proposal, um, and I've, I've yet to have one, and I say that in the most sincere of, or, and, and, and fair play to Meriton, the, the most sincere of uh, ways, I, I have not had one person who has thought uh, that this is a good idea. Talking to very reasonable people who understand that we live in a growing city, but no one can tell me, uh, and no one can reasonably say that 17 storeys 
on a sensitive coastal environment at the end of a peninsula with no major transport links next to one, two and up to five storey uh, uh, residential is a reasonable proposal. For those reasons, uh, I move that the uh, recommendation as proposed uh, in the business paper be accepted and that we refuse this planning proposal. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Councillor Luxford, a second. Um, I reserve my right to speak. Uh, Councillor Servinos, Councillor Bowen after that. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, I'm glad sanity has prevailed in relation to this proposal and I commend council staff on putting together such a comprehensive report which slams this gross overdevelopment and outlines the impact that it will have on the amenity of residents. What angers me, Mr Mayor, is the fact that this developer bought this site with a master plan for 450 units and this would have been factored into the cost of the land when they bought it, which was $245 million. Now, as an accountant who works with a number of builders in the construction industry, I estimate that to build 450 units at a cost of $250,000 per unit, that the cost of this development, including land value, would be approximately $360 million. Now, with an average unit price of around a million, of course, all these figures are excluding GST, the developer stands to make a $90 million profit, if not more. But what the developer is trying to do now is change the goalposts to not only throw out this master plan, but they are now looking to add a further 1,500 dwellings on top of the 450 being proposed, which will not only boost their profit to well over a billion dollars, but would create severe breaches of our LEP and DCP controls, not to mention the fact that our local infrastructure particularly our roads and public trans transport system, wouldn't be able to sustain such a mass overdevelopment of the site. What do you think the community impact would be of an additional 1,500 units being added to this site? Not only does Little Bay lack the road infrastructure to sustain an additional 5,000 people that we're talking about living in the area, but the public transport system wouldn't be able to cope. And as the state government have made no major announcements in relation to mass transit for the area, my concern is the traffic implication and uh, what, what that would have on the surrounding suburbs, not only Little Bay but the surrounding areas. And we know from the report that we have before us tonight that residents that live in these surrounding areas here are very heavily reliant on motor vehicles to get in and out of the area. How many extra traffic movements would be created by this overdevelopment? Uh, parking, which Councillor Parker didn't mention, is also deficient in this report. It, it, that, and that's a major concern because what we're talking about is a, is a deficiency of over 970 car spaces. Now, I can tell you that parking might not be a problem for the area now, but if this development was to go ahead, parking would be a problem. And as a councillor who, uh, who uh, you know, councillor for West Ward, I know all about parking and traffic issues, I can tell you that now, and that's something that you don't want here in the south. Uh, the development would also see 17-storey towers being built on a site, which I don't believe could sustain it. Uh, the additional units, I mean, that would uh, create overshadowing, environmental impacts, uh, view impacts, uh, you know, impacts on density, the list just goes on. And I'm sorry to say this, but it's all motivated by greed. That's what it boils down to, greed. I can't see what benefit this proposal will have for our community, and that's why I will not be supporting it tonight. As a council, which is currently formulating its housing strategy, I've always been an advocate for sensible and sustainable development, whether it be duplexes, townhouses, and medium density housing, similar to what we have here at Prince Henry. I will never advocate for mass high rise, which takes away from our sense of community, and as a councillor who was very vocal in speaking against K to K and the gross order overdevelopment of Kingsford and Kensington, I need to do what's right, not only for my ward, but for our city. And I'll be standing up against this proposal. I endorse the report before us tonight, and I hope that council uh, continues the fight against what we have before us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Vinos. Councillor Bowen. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. I've got a question. Um, uh, Councillor Stavrinos and, and the Speaker against the recommendation um, both touched upon the KDK experience. And uh, I was just, it, it, it caused me to think about 
the history of um, rezoning applications that have been made to this council, and I'm mindful of the Inglis uh, rezoning where we refused it and it was referred by the then planning minister to the then uh, JRPP, I think it was. And then of course, the experience at Councillor Stavrinos just uh, touched upon of the KDK, uh, which was that if the council didn't, um, there seemed to be some perception of a threat from the minister, no less, that if, um, and council had refused a number of uh, spot rezonings, uh, along the Anzac Parade Corridor, King, Kingsford and Kensington. And then we perceived that we were under some threat that if we could, if we did, um, if, unless we did rezone, there would be a much greater rezoning. Uh, I, my question then is, where does this proposal go from here if we support the recommendation, as I most strongly do, um, to refuse the, um, the proposal what are the, my question is, what are the, um, what are the applicants' avenues uh, if, if this is refused, bearing in mind the experience of this council? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the proponent has um, sought a review of the planning proposal um, and that has been submitted with the, the Department of Planning. Um, the Department of Planning um, have advised us they're awaiting on Council's decision on the matter. Um, however, should Council uh, resolve that the proposal not proceed to Gateway, uh, then it's likely that the planning proposal will be um, referred to the Sydney Houston City Planning Panel for them to review uh, the proposal and determine um, on their own assessment whether it has strategic and site-specific merit. Um, if the uh, planning panel does decide that it proceed to Gateway, um, then the council will have the option um, to be a planning uh, a approval authority at that stage and can decide it at that time. So just in that process that you've described, um, uh, Kerry, um, who makes the decision to refer it to the panel? planning panel or the, the similar, is that, a, is that a, an exercise of the minister's discretion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that's delegated to the uh, Department of Planning and officers there to uh, refer it to the Sydney Houston City Planning Panel. Um, thanks very much, that's very informative. Um, I'll, I'll be supporting the um, recommendation. Councillor D'Souza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, as was made evident by Mr. Gould, this proposal by Meriton is motivated by greed, not need. It's a proposal that is thinly veiled by desire to stimulate the New South Wales economy and to satisfy the housing shortage. But these claims are totally fallacious. The new proposal by Meriton will lead to overdevelopment on a grand scale on a site that has already been approved for a major housing project, which has community support and will stimulate our economy. The initial project with height and scale restrictions ticked all the boxes and therefore had been approved by Randwick City Council with a maximum height of five storeys and not 20 storeys that is now being proposed by Meriton in its new plans. Needless to say, we do not have the infrastructure and in particular the transport infrastructure to support such a major project. And to make things worse, as was made evident by union officials, if privatisation of the bus services occurs, besides loss of jobs, then it will destroy the social fabric of our community. This would further erode the, the ability, this is the loss of our bus services, will further erode the ability to service this over development. Because bus services, whether we like it or not, when privatisation occurs, jobs are lost, 
and services are decreased. Now it becomes obvious to those of us that have read our reports and those who are in the audience who have access to the reports that the director of city planning has made it quite clear in his report that this project lacks merit. Now let's just go into it and I'll touch on it because everyone could read it for themselves. The council does not support the planning proposal proposals submitted by Urbis, but why? The planning proposal fails to meet the strategic merit test. It goes on to tell us in detail why. Second, the planning proposal is inconsistent with the council's recently endorsed structure plan for future housing growth and set out in a housing strategy. Turn the page and we can read it all for yourself. But what concerns me, the likely adverse environmental effects identified in council's officers' assessment in regard to density, building heights, massing, view impacts, overshadowing, access and con connectivity, and also, Alibaba is among us today, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal heritage. The concerns raised by the Heritage Council and the Heritage New South Wales and the planning proposal goes on to tell us there is no support for this proposal, not in government circles, not in council circles, and I think there's little appetite in this council for this proposal. I think it'll lose and it should lose. Now, I want to make another point which is in this report and councillors, you all have access to the alternative master plan document is inadequate and lacks information including the maximum building heights and goes on to talk about FSR. The transport analysis, and this is so important because we have our union representatives here and we're keeping in mind this privatisation, the soul destroying project. The transport analysis used to justify the proposal is based on unrealistic assumptions. That's all there in black and white. There's a whole page why this shouldn't occur. And if we get privatisation of the bus services that further confirm the services will be decreased, people are going to lose their jobs. And uh, this overdevelopment cannot be serviced, not while we've got the bus services that we have now, and not by the decreased bus services which will occur if privatisation occurs. Now, councillors, this report is clear. I don't think there's any appetite in this room to support any overdevelopment, and there should be none. Our officers have done a thorough study. The New South Wales relevant government authorities have spoken, Transport New South Wales. Let's put this matter to the sword and get put it way, way behind us. Thank you. Councillor Derosha. Um, I support Council's recommendation. I think that this um, proposed overdevelopment will rip the guts out of the Little Bay community and take away all its characteristics that we've fought for so long to try to keep. Um, how dare you, you know, um, come into, you know, um, an area, you know, like Little Bay, you know, um, and then try to impose this massive overdevelopment on us. How dare you take away that sense of community that we pride ourselves on by trying to put these, you know, um, ridiculous high rises, you know, in an area that's just not equipped to cater for, for, you know, for the amount of residents and the amount of people that you want to, you know, um, to live there. How dare you, you know, um, say, you know, when you were talking that there are a lot of people that are frightened to come forth and, and have a say, otherwise that they would. We are at a rally when there was all the residents, there was all the locals. This was not a higher crowd. This was the crowd that went to the Little Bay protest going back a while ago to protect Little Bay from overdevelopment. Meriton, you've got the money, you've got, you know, go somewhere else. L listen to the communities. Feel proud that you're going to turn away and not destroy the heart of something that's so precious to us. We've been a dumping ground for so many things. We tried to get the UAP shoved the upon us where they gave us Lego blocks and they said, where would you like to see these high rises? Well, we don't want them at Little Bay. So please take a message back and say, care for us, you know, and um, find another location. Any other councillors wish to speak? Yeah, look, I, I support the, um, the, 
the recommendation. I've just got some questions in regards to the um, voluntary planning agreement, which is um, on page um, 61 of the council business paper. So if council proceeds with the recommendation tonight, um, just a question to the um, director of, um, of, of city planning. Um, how in the future, if this application for some reason does go ahead, not through obviously our authority, but through another authority, would there be any chance in the future to negotiate the 76 affordable housing apartments to council, the $17.5 million contributions to council for local community works, um, the $8 million under, under existing section 711 plan? It, is there any way, are we, are we for, for are we now forfeiting that, or if it, is there a way in the future, um, if this proposal is, is approved by some other authority, of us ever being able to um, negotiate a VPA or some benefit to our community? Because my concern is, yeah, we're all against it now, but what is if it does go ahead because the planning minister decides it, it, it's going to go ahead, are we going to lose all this benefit? Is there any way we can, in the future, ensure that we still get our 76 affordable housing apartments? Put that question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that question uh, would only arise down the track if the Seed and Use and City Planning Panel, as, as you said, uh, recommended that it proceed to a gateway determination and that there uh, was some further assessment uh, a, a merit um, in relation to the density that was provide, being provided for on the site. Um, I will note, however, that uh, voluntary planning agreements are one means by um, negotiating infrastructure uh, contributions on sites, and there are other opportunities, um, including 711 um, and 712 uh, uh, contributions plan, as well as potential for special infrastructure contributions, um, which with the agreement of the Department of Planning. Um, Council is also uh, subject to CEP 70, the affordable housing policy, and in those circumstances, um, there may be an opportunity through that mechanism by which to, to look at uh, provision of affordable housing based on, on uplift that is either decided through um, further assessment of the proposal. Any further comments? So, Councillors, uh, Councillor Parker, do you want to? Uh, look, I think it's all been said. So I'll now put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? I declare that carried. Unanimously. Unanimously, exactly. Um, we ask the other councillors to come back in now, please. Councillors, now we move on to NM41-20. Notice the motion from Councillor D'Souza, acknowledging and supporting the Aboriginal community. Um, do I have a seconder? Councillor DeRocha, uh, Councillor D'Souza. <coughs> Mr Mayor, do you know about David Dungay Jr? He was a Dungati man and uncle. He had a talent for poetry and made his family endlessly proud. He was held down by six correctional service officers in a prone position until he died, and twice injected with sedatives because he ate rice crackers in his cell. Mr. Dungay's last words were, I can't breathe. Mr. Mayor, we had a royal commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody in 1987, and it is very disappointing that no significant actions have been taken since the Royal Commission, Commission ended in 1991. Tonight, Mr Mayor, in this chamber, I too am choking and suffocating and cannot easily 
<coughs> breathe as I discuss the uncomfortable truth about the injustice, the intolerance, the inequity and the prejudice that exists in our society towards many of our Indigenous people. Our justice system has let them down. Our policing and correctional system has failed them. The government must act and act quickly to remedy the situation. It must correct the past wrongs and injustices faced by our Indigenous people. That is why, Mr Mayor, I brought this notice of motion to this council. Mr Mayor, it's because black lives matter. Mr Mayor, I refuse to believe the Bank of Justice is bankrupt or that the vaults of opportunity for change are empty. As Annie Barbara said, Prime Minister Rudd said sorry to the stolen generation, yet their heirs, their grandsons and their granddaughters are not fully free and we haven't yet closed the gap when it comes to health, education and opportunity. We still have a long way to go. Our Indigenous people are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. And our Indigenous people have one of the highest rates of incarceration in Australia. Since 1989, the imprisonment rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people has increased 12 times faster than the rate of non-Aboriginal people. In December 2019, the rate was 2,536 prisoners per 100,000 adult Aboriginal population, compared to 218 prisoners per 100,000 non-Aboriginal population. Aboriginal deaths in custody were 434 since 1991. This disparity becomes even more obvious when you take into consideration Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults make up around 2% of the national population and yet they constitute 27% of the national prison population. In 2016, around 20 in every 1,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were incarcerated. And that doesn't stop there. When you take into consideration our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, they constitute 34% of the female prison population. In 1991, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody found that the Aboriginal population was grossly overrepresented in custody, yet it appears the government has not yet acted. The Royal Commission also noted that Aboriginal people are in gross disproportionate numbers compared with non-Aboriginal people in both police and prison custody. And it is this fact that may provide the immediate explanation for the disturbing number of Aboriginal deaths in custody. Mr Mayor, the over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the criminal justice system is a national disgrace. And we as a society must take immediate action to correct these disproportionate figures. Mr May, even today our Aboriginal people are not included in our constitution. The constitution was drafted at a time when Australia was considered a land that belonged to no one before European settlement and when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were considered a dying race, not worthy of citizenship or humanity. Even today, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are not mentioned in the Constitution. But this is beyond the scope of this Council, and I will not dwell on it. My friends, there should be little need for debate on this motion. Its intent and purpose is clear. We must write to the Prime Minister and the Attorney Generals to assess, to address this, these disproportionate figures. Where there is wrong, councillors, we have a duty to right it. Where there is injustice, we have a duty to correct it. Where there is suffering, we have a duty to stop it. Where there is discord, we must create harmony. And where there is despair, we must offer hope. 
unless we address this issue of black deaths in custody and the disproportionate number of indigenous people in incarceration, we will never be united as a country. Protests will continue. Let me conclude by saying, if there is no justice, there will be no peace. This country, for all its hopes and boasts of giving people a fair go, will not be true to itself or a true democracy until all its citizens are given the same opportunities, protections and freedoms. Thank you, Mr. Ben. Thank you for the extra minute. Thank you, Councillor D'Souza. Councillor Russia. Uh, just a little story. Um, this little bush munchkin um, who was born under a tree, grew up with English as a third language, went to, a com uh, went to complete a Bachelor of um, and Applied Science in Aboriginal uh, Community Management and Development, um, as a, was a young mother and then became a Minister of the Crown, became the only woman in Cabinet. This incredible person was a loving mother NITV and SBS do not celebrate the achievements because she does not adhere to the left-wing agenda. When an Aboriginal person is not recognised or celebrated for being able to think for themselves, you have to wonder who is actually keeping us down. This person celebrates her achievements because it's her daughter who said this. Now, I didn't put any names to this because this applies to all Aboriginal communities. This applies to all Aboriginal people who have studied, who have done their very, very best to try and just, you know, um, be recognised for their achievement. But for some reason, you know, we throw, we'll throw money towards something, but then is that help? Do we follow through to make sure that, you know, throughout the whole process from when they were a little baby to, 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 to they're an adult, that we support them through thick and thin, that we support the, the parents, that we try to, you know, embrace the culture so that, you know, we can teach our kids about it and not just think that, okay, we are a multicultural, but multiculturalism should come after, you know, we learn a bit more about our Indigenous and the people that, you know, that, that have got so much to tell. They've got so many languages to tell. We could be learning at schools just so that we know where our history lays, what Australia was all about. I mean, growing up, the furthest I lived pretty much was out, anything outside Anzac Parade, I'll get lost, but where the driving's where I live now, growing up, a lot of my Aboriginal mates, you know, like they, they sort of gave up, you know, um, because a lot of times they just thought, well, what the hell, who cares, right? Well. I, I sort of grew up and I started thinking, well, I was an ethnic, I'm, I'm an ethnic, sorry, and I grew up like a lot of the Aboriginal communities fighting first just to be accepted in this great country that I call Australia. And a lot of them, you know, they used to just say to me, mate, it's our country, you know, you're welcome, you know. We've got to just show that we start to actually care about, you know, what happens to them, why so many of them end up on drugs or killing themselves. We've got to show some love and we've just got to, you know, start showing and, and caring for home first. And, um, Ani Baba, I love what you said. No, and um, the Aboriginal community, we, we have to embrace it, we have to live it and we have to learn it. Thank you, Councillor Rocha. Councillor Servinos. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, um, I've kept very quiet in relation to these sensitive matters for uh, quite a while, but I think tonight is an appropriate time to tell the story of my family, because not many people know, the 18th of May 1997 may not mean a lot to many people here tonight, but to my family, it means a lot. Because on that day, my uncle was found hanging in his prison cell in Maitland Maximum Security Prison. As the story goes, my uncle uh, tried to escape from that prison with Ivan Milat. And um, what they then did the night before it all happened, they said that uh, they put them in separate cells so that they, uh, you know, they uncovered what had happened. And the following morning at 9.05 a.m., my uncle was found hanging in his prison cell. Now, two years after he died, a coronial inquest into his passing found that he died from suicide. There was never an apology to his wife or to his two children about what had happened. And I think it's important tonight that we not only talk about Indigenous deaths in custody, 
but we remember those who are non-Indigenous who have also passed away in our prison and police custody. We know that over the last five years there have been 224 deaths in custody, 30 have been Indigenous, and there have been 194 that are non-Indigenous. And from 1990 until 2008, 1,513 people have died in custody. Of that amount, 279 were Indigenous and 1,234 were non-Indigenous. The point I'm trying to make here, Mr Mayor, tonight is that irrespective of whether you're black or white or Calathumpian, at the end of the day, a death is a death. Life is precious, irrespective of your colour, race or creed or religion or whatever it might be. And for me, I think it's important to make that comment. Of course I will be supporting this motion tonight, but I want to make these comments so that they're on record. I think it's important. Now, any sort of racism should not be tolerated. And I know Aunty Barb got up tonight and spoke about uh, ra the racism and the and challenges that were faced by, uh, by the Indigenous communities. But I could tell you, Mr Mayor, that as a migrant, my father who came to this country in 1967, October of 1967, was also subjected. Councillor Beach. Point of order, I'm not sure that this actually addresses with, with full respect to uh, Councillor Stavrinos's loss in his family, um, I don't think he is addressing the motion. This is a very serious motion. Uh, we have highly respected uh, members of our Aboriginal community here tonight, Ahi Baba. And I think this is actually very disrespectful. I'm not talking against the motion, I'm actually talking for the motion, but I think it's important... I, I, would I think this is actually a very important point. Uh, this, is a, uh, this motion is a very important motion. Mr. I, I, and I think the points have been made in the public realm that obviously all... any death is terrible, but we are actually, acknowledging a certain... Uh, Councillor Beach, Councillor Beach, I... I look. Councillor Srebrenovs, I, I do know where you're going with this and I, I feel for you, but I will say that it is an Indigenous, it's an Aboriginal uh, motion. And I've, I've confirmed that with Councillor D'Souza, so it is regarding uh, especially Black Lives Matter. I, I know where you're going and I'm, I, happy I, I'm to not trying to cut you off. I will be supporting this motion, but I think that what the, the, the concern and the note that we should be making tonight is that no racism should be tolerated irrespective of whether you're black or white or whatever race or creed you may be. I think that that is what we should be formulating. I agree with the motion, because I know that Indigenous uh, numbers in, in incarceration are heavily reflected, but I think that it should be noted that we, as a sense of community that we represent for Ramwick, that we're, we include every single group, and I think that's important to note. And, and I know a number of migrants that came to this country faced a lot of adverse challenges when it came to racism. And my father, along with many people, was no, well, well, it's not any exception to that rule. And I think that that should be noted. And I'll leave it at that because if, if people want to get sensitive with me and they want to play games with this, I'm not prepared to play that game. I'm here tonight to make a point. And I, and that, and I think I've made that point and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and you've done it well. Thank you, Councillor D'Souza. Councillor Park. Uh, look, um, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, I, I would just like to begin um, by c commending this motion, but also just recognising, uh, f from a personal perspective, what a uh, an interesting and, and quite difficult time it is for um, people of colour across the world in, in, in looking at police violence. Um, as someone who is um, of African American descent, I have been quite surprised. Um, personally quite detached from it, how, um, uh, how significantly um, listening and watching and hearing um, about some of the things which have gone have impacted me. Um, and, and what I uh, would like to say and why I actually commend this motion is I think that some of the events around the world have refocused um, our attention, not just abroad, um, but in getting our house in order uh, at home. And, and I think um, one thing which is important um, to, to recognise that is not necessarily uh, the clear stated and believed uh, s uh, feelings or sentiments of racism that you can see. It, it's, it's the ones that you cannot see. Uh, and, and it's the structures um, and the systems that lead 
um, to negative uh, and, and, and worse outcomes for individuals who, when they are born, should have no different life chances, uh, no different uh, likelihood of ending up in incarceration, no di difference in terms of uh, how they are necessarily treated by police. And, and we just know as a fact that that is, is just not true, whether statistically or in, in the lived experience of people. So, so look, I, I think that this is um, quite a, a, a very reasonable and expected uh, motion and, and what I think uh, is important for us as a local government area, not necessarily to say that we will have an agreement on any particular policy area, um, but to refocus our attention on the fact that um, the, just because the events are happening across the world um, uh, may seem remote, um, there, there are plenty um, which are, uh, go unaddressed as, a, as an open wound and, and have for many people not healed but um, every day are lived and felt. So, look, I, I commend uh, this particular motion um, and um, I, I, I will end my remarks on that. Uh, Councillor Matson and then Councillor Andrews. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, I, I regret Councillor Stavrinas's input uh, of a few minutes ago. I think my colleague, uh, Councillor Veach, was correct to draw it to your attention, uh, uh, perhaps not in the procedural way she, that she did, but I, I will take the opportunity to say, look, you have to accept or not accept that there is an issue in Australia called black deaths in custody, and I accept that there is. Um, prime ministers have noted it. Po politicians of many different persuasions have noted it. For Councillor Stavrinas to get up and say, and basically imply that this does not... Uh, uh, Councillor Matson, Councillor Hamilton, yes. Uh, uh, just, again, we won't go back With on to respect, what Councillor Stavrinas said. With all respect, Mr Mayor, stick, stick for Councillor uh, Stavrinas to say Councilor that Matson, this was not a Councilor particular... Matson, I, I, I accepted the point of order from Councillor Veach, and now we're going straight on to the... Can you please speak on the motion which I you think off. that Thank um, you very much. it is undeniable that there is an issue in Australia called black deaths in custody that it is of unique significance to the indigenous population I think that we need to acknowledge it if we make the mistake of saying that somehow this is a shared issue across many different multicultural ethnic groups we move away from acknowledging that there is a very specific issue to the indigenous population and that is the existence of black deaths in custody. I'm sorry, Mr Mayor, but I think you and I might disagree on that and I find that disappointing. For... Um, Councillor Andrews. Thanks. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Look, I'll, I'll get up to, to um, support the uh, motion by Councillor D'Souza which has been seconded by Councillor um, um, de Rocha. And I'm very proud of um, Councillor D'Souza for moving this motion tonight. Um, the Aboriginal community are very close to my heart. Um, and I note uh, Aunty Barb's address tonight. She talks about the lack of representation of Aboriginal people on this council. And that was one thing which I um, have always had a concern about. And in the last council election, I, I think it was the only um, councillor um, who had a team who had an Aboriginal um, um, candidate who, who ran for the Central Ward. And I, my aim and my motive was to have him elected as the first Aboriginal descendant um, of, of this community onto Ranbury Council. Unfortunately, we did not get up on that occasion, but we'll be back again next time to ensure that we do have an Aboriginal representative um, on this council. But the Aboriginal community, to me, have always been close to my heart. Um, my son has um, Aboriginal in him, and I always stand by our um, local Aboriginal community, and I always support our local Aboriginal community here in Ramwick. I think we're one of the um, best um, communities I've ever met, and I've had a lot to do with Aboriginal people um, in my life, and I experienced um, going to Arnhem Land when I was um, back to school at the Scots College. We had um, um, kids from the, um, actually, um, his name was um, the Yinapingu family, um, who will um, know from music, um, I had the opportunity of actually going to um, their um, land in Arlen land and, and spend some time in the school holidays. So I've, I've been very close to the Aboriginal community and I always will be, and I support um, Councillor D'Souza's motion tonight and congratulate him for bringing this forward. Councillor uh, Roberts first and then Councillor Bowen. 
Could I just uh, suggest a, an amendment to the mover that uh, an additional sentence uh, or point be put in there where council uh, notes with concern the recent video footage of a 16-year-old boy um, having, a, having his legs taken out of him? Would you be interested in inserting that? Issue with it. Anything that exposes the <clears throat> injustice our people have suffered, anything which shows it and uh, brings it to the attention of the relevant authorities, I'll fully support. And I'm happy to accept it. And Councillor De Rocha as well, I'm sure. This should have been a joint motion and we were going to do it in that way, but we thought to ensure it got up, we would run it separately and he would second it. But I'm sure both of us agree to it. Yes, Councillor? Sorry, Councillor Vaughan, I, I skipped Councillor Nielsen, sorry. And I also commend this uh, motion. I think it's uh, very pertinent for the troubled ties we have at the moment. And the sad fact is that we're concentrating on Black Lives Matter. Black lives have always mattered. But our Indigenous community have had an incredibly bad time ever since, unfortunately, white people set foot on uh, the land that we now call Australia. I think this motion is very good. And then following up, um, Councillor um, De Rocha, uh, sorry, Councillor De Souza and Councillor De Rocha, I was just wondering whether we could amend uh, point five slightly um, to mayor organise a meeting with um, the local Aboriginal Land Council and local area commander and other interested councillors to address any pressing matters of concern of our local Indigenous people especially when it comes to local policing, because I think the heart-rending uh, tale that we were told tonight has further opened our eyes to the necessity that we need to be more involved, more responsible, and, and I think the more the police realise that all of us, or as many of us uh, who want to go along, are very concerned and totally supportive of our Indigenous community, I think it would just strengthen the relationship and our support of our community. So it's just basically um, uh, the second line, uh, local area commander uh, and, and himself, meaning the mayor, and other local councillors to address. Would that be acceptable to you, please? <clears throat> that is the wisdom of a former wear, uh, mayor who showed us the way and continues to show the way. Of course I accept it, and Nielsen, thank you very much. We want to build an inclusive community, and if that helps uh, make a point to the area commander that all us councillors are, are, are supporting this particular motion, it'll certainly have more meaning and substance. So yes, I'm happy to embrace both those amendments, and I'm sure Councillor De Rocha is happy with that too. Anything that strengthens this motion, like you've just said then, and what Councillor Roberts has said, this is what this was all about. Um, when Nani Bob first mentioned that young boy and she rang me and told me what had happened, um, I tried so hard to get someone to reach out for her to give her a little bit of condolence, a condolence, a bit of heartfelt. Um, so then I was able to get a previous commander who took my call to contact Arnie Barb and just say, you know, like, um, is everything okay? Because she was devastated and I think so we all were from what we saw on television. Not, you know, we're not bagging the police, but we just want things to be better for everybody. Councillor Bowen. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to make a few very brief comments uh, and uh, congratulate the author of the motion, Councillor D'Souza, the seconder, Councillor De Rocha and uh, I'd like to um, offer my uh, deep appreciation for Annie Barb coming along, giving her insight in a remarkable way as she's done for so long, uh, representing her community. And it reminded me uh, of um, how lucky we are as a community in Randwick to have a indigenous community amongst us with an unbroken connection to this area, to this land, going back 60,000 years um, for all time. And what a wonderful contribution uh, that is and to us as a, as a society and as a local government area. 
and I'm often reminded that uh, you know the great uh, pride our Indigenous community takes in their survival and so they should and I think every time we uh, celebrate those Australian characteristics of um, what we call Australian characteristics of equality, of our informality, our um, willingness to share, our easygoing nature. I, I personally believe that is very much rooted in the Indigenous traditions and that uh, far from surviving, that, that culture is thriving, in fact it's dominating. And on a personal note, I, I, was, I will never forget um, when I had my time as mayor, I was fortunate enough to uh, go down to um, Yarra Bay, invited by the Land Council for the fifth anniversary of the apology, and, uh, and I was unsure how I, what I could say to that community, having all the opportunities that I've been fortunate enough to have in my life and knowing the hardship uh, that, that was in that room. But I'll never forget how welcome I felt, uh, how accepting, and I, I was presented with a framed um, version of Kevin Rudd's apology, which has sat proudly in my office in town for however long since. And I often look at it and I often think of, of what a great um, instruction that has been to me personally. So it's been a difficult time the last few weeks around the world and locally, but it's good that we're talking about it and we need to keep working at it. It might seem hard and for a personal point of view, I've always thought we should change Australia Day. We should move it to another day. How can we possibly move forward as a community when we have this day which must signify pain, injustice, suffering, for such an important part of our community. That's my personal belief. I know we're not voting on that tonight, but, um, uh, and uh, there's so much to celebrate in, in our community. And um, I'm often reminded of the words of the Warumpi band, white fella, black fella. I know it's probably genders should be in there somewhere, but I think that is a great anthem for all of us to celebrate. It's a wonderful motion and I'll certainly be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Bowen. Any further speakers? Oh, Councillors. I'd like to congratulate Councillor D'Souza for bringing this motion. It's very timely, given the mass protests in this country and throughout the world. Mr. Mayor, I do feel embarrassed and disappointed and even outraged each time I read about deaths in custody of uh, our indigenous people. We ask ourselves, why? Why is this still happening? Why is that our indigenous people continue to be discriminated, marginalized, incarcerated, and even brutalized by the police? Why are they being treated differently than the rest of the population. Why is it that the population, the prison population of the indigenous people is about 25, 27% as we've been told by uh, Councillor D'Souza just now, which is all true, when the population of our indigenous people is only about 3%. Something is wrong somewhere. Our policies, whether at, at federal or state level, have not been that successful. Let's admit that, or else we wouldn't be seeing all these things happening. We wouldn't be hearing all these st statistics. Very heartbreaking to see Aboriginal people be mistreated. Tonight, Mr. Mayor, I don't want to continue just to pay lip service. I think we need concrete action here. Now, point number five is good. Having a meeting with our local area commander is good, involving our Aboriginal Land Council and representatives of the Aboriginal people. But it shouldn't stop there. I want to see concrete action. No more talk fest. Enough of that. We need real action real effective action. I don't want to see any more death in custody of all races if we can, but we can avoid that, of course. But 
something is wrong when the population of our indigenous people is 3% or less than 3% when we have almost 30% in the prison population. We have to admit that. Mr. Mayor, as a representative of the people, I really feel embarrassed and disappointed. Because sometimes I feel that I have let down our Aboriginal people. Because we are here. Yes. Just try to put yourselves, ourselves in their shoes. How many more years they have to continue to suffer? 200 years? 300 years? Mr. Mayor, I, I, I hope every one of us here today, tonight, will support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Any further speakers? I uh, conclude. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, councillors. It's really, really important that we support our Indigenous people. And uh, I'm going to actually close with a song of hope. It's the same hymn or song we would sing in the streets of Balmain when Mr. Brown, the former general manager, and myself grew up. We had nothing but each other, football and the song of hope. The same song they sing in the streets of Liverpool. And I say this to Aunty Barbara from my heart. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high. And don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm, there is a golden sky in the sweet silver song of the lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain. Even if your dreams are tossed and blown, when you walk, walk on. And with hope in your heart, and you will never walk alone. And as you heard these wonderful counsellors, there are people here that will support you and you will never walk alone. Thank you, Aunty Barbara, and thank you, councillors. Thank you very much. So, councillors, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, I declare that carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Aunty Barb. Thank you, Councillor D'Souza. Now we move on to NM 43-20. Notice a motion from Councillor Luxford and Councillor Parker and Councillor Shuri, bus privates privatisation. Um, Councillor Luxford, you're the mover. Councillor Shuri, would you like to second it? Yep. Councillor Luxford. Okay, Mr Mayor. Um, thank, first of all, thank you to the members of the RTBU that were here tonight to support this motion. Um, in November 2019, Councillor Shuri and myself moved a joint motion um, regarding the bus privatisation. Uh, here we are again tonight moving another motion in support of the bus drivers, the community and the state of New South Wales. This government is selling off our state and its services. They no longer want to provide services for the people of New South Wales. More importantly, this issue now affects, it affects our community and it affects our community by means of transport, by the workers that live in our community that will inevitably be out of jobs. We can't let this happen and we need to seek assurances from the Transport Minister and the government that they won't cut the services to to our city and to the state. The 302 bus is a bus route that is quite dear to my heart. You know, once upon a time, we had the 301 right through to the 304, and most of those buses came through West Kensington. There are a lot of elderly people that live in the West Kensington area, people who've lived there all their lives, and, you know, they relied on those bus services. One by one, they've been eradicated. We now only have the 302 bus. It goes to East Gardens, but going the other way to the city, it stops at Redfern Station. This is not a good service. It's not a service for these people. 
because when they get out at Redfern Station, they have to negotiate the actual station, the steps, the whole thing, to get on a train to then continue their journey into the city takes them nowhere near that where they want to go. And, you know, they in the end, they just don't go anywhere. The 302 bus, along with others that are mentioned in our motion, are earmarked, we believed, to slowly disappear from the face of the earth. We need service for our community. Our community should not be disadvantaged by the sell-off and privatisation of services by the state government. So I, so I wish that you all support this motion because by supporting this motion, you're supporting our community, you're supporting consultation that we are asking from the state government regarding the services that they provide. Of order. I, I believe the motion should have been moved by Councillor Shuri, seconded by Councillor Luxford. And if you look at the, the way the business paper was printed and so on, Councillor Shuri's motion was in first. But um, Councillor Shuri actually said she was willing to merge hers into Councillor Luxford's. Is that correct? Yes, I think you're playing with I, words. No, I'm just asking Councillor Shuri, is that correct? She meant, uh, sorry, I, can I speak? I think Councillor Shuri was playing a very polite way of saying that the two motions should be merged into one. However, Councillor Shuri, still, my argument I think is correct, or my position is correct, in that hers was the first motion. So. Um, I think that that would be the correct way of going. No offence to Councillor Luxford, and she doesn't mind either because. I have to say, all three names are still going to appear on the. All three names will appear on the motion. I, I'd amend it because it'd be exactly the same. Sure, a second. Do you want to speak? It's 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 all okay. Fine. Okay. okay. Councillor Park. Let's keep, move on. A question. Question first. Just just a question. I the speaker um, I believe was T W U, and is there? A, sorry, what is it? My my apologies. Are they financial uh, supporters of the Labor Party? And if if so, has Labor councillors declared a conflict of interest or not? A non-significant, at least, that the that the speaker is a financial contributor to the Labor Party. Order is that actually the deputy mayor pointed it out very carefully. We all have a conflict, a, a non-pecuniary, because most of us take buses. So I think we should all declare a non-pecuniary. I'll take that. It's just advice. a question. I'm just wondering if. if uh, <laughs> Okay, so there's no, no declaration of interest by Labor councillors, okay? Um, Councillor Shuri, I, I, I think rather than uh, tit for tat, I actually have, I have no issue with it because I have no idea whether they are or not until they can be pointed out to me that they are. I don't need to declare it. Mr Mayor, both members here tonight are not financial members of the Labor Party. Have my mic turned on. Okay. Well, the qu I, I can answer the question. There's a. Councillor Shuri, the unions Parker. are not allowed to donate to Labor Party. So I don't know what. There's no financial contribution. There's, there's certainly no financial contribution, as far as I'm aware, to any Labor councillor. Um, uh, I'm reminded of the classic phrase, uh, play the ball, not the man. Councillor <laughs> Parker. Um, look, if, if that was the strongest argument which Councillor Roberts uh, would raise, it is an argument which I would happily have with him uh, in public, uh, and, and whether it be in the media or any uh, forum, because the privatisation of our bus services, in my view, is an issue which should be uh, given uh, as much possible airing 
uh, as possible. Look, I commend Councillor uh, Luxford and Shuri for moving this motion. Um, Councillor Luxford spoke very uh, eloquently in regards to the impact of the privatisation of services uh, on local residents, um, and I firmly support these two councillors uh, in, in their uh, opposition to this. Um, it was previously raised in regards to the loss of job uh, protections uh, and employment guarantees, as well as uh, an erosion uh, of conditions for employees. Uh, I, I think that is a very significant um, thing which uh, we as elected uh, representatives uh, should uh, be thinking of, especially in the light that we have made such significant song and dance about uh, the importance of supporting employment in these uh, very testing uh, COVID-19 times. And I, I think if there was ever a time where you would want to be uh, bolstering our workplace protections, uh, it would be now. Um, the other thing I would point out is the New South Wales government um, in their privatisation agenda has been pretty clear, um, despite uh, trying to claim otherwise, that any privatised service would uh, result in a uh, reduced service for residents. And, and we know that because uh, in many instances they've prohibited uh, STA from being able to compete for the tender. And the reason why they have done that is because they know that a private provider um, will not provide um, an equivalent service. Um, they may agree to do it for a temporary period of time, but um, over time the profit motive kicks in because, and it was raised by the previous speaker, that is what a good company does. Uh, it will look for savings, it will look uh, for ways where it can increase its profit, uh, and, and that ultimately will mean fewer stops um, reduced numbers of routes um, and, and a lack of reliability. And, and we know that because that has been the experience in every area where our buses have been privatised. And, and why this is directly relevant as a council area is because w just previously tonight we made uh, a significant decision on the planning controls of our city. And one major consideration uh, around planning controls and the ability to support uh, development uh, is the ongoing uh, transport capacity going forward into the future. And I can't see a situation where a private operator is going to be able to um, run uh, successfully uh, a bus service to uh, adequately support um, our community. Um, not only that, I would further say, and it wasn't mentioned by the Councillor Luxford or Councillor Shuri, that there is a proposal to axe up to 16 routes to force uh, local residents onto the light rail uh, it was a $3 billion uh, project which nobody wants to catch. And if you look at the carriages now, they're empty. And the reason why they're empty is because the current uh, existing SDA transport run a superior bus service. I, I, I have caught the light rail once, and I have not caught it again because there is no reason to catch it, because all of the existing bus services provide a superior service. Um, on that, I will end, but I commend this motion uh, to the Council. Councillor D'Souza. Mr Mayor. Privatisation is a soul-destroying exercise. Now, I would like all of us to think about one successful privatisation move. Think of GIO and how it protected us, and now we, we thought, hey, and Park, Council Park are quite pretty. It all starts with, oh, there's massive savings. It's going to lead to improved competition. All these things, yes, it did start in that way. But then what happened? Now it's so expensive to get a green slip. You know, what is privatisation? Privatisation is the selling of a public asset. A public asset is owned by all of us. It's like the army. It's like defence. It's all those things which, if you had a choice and say, I'm going to choose to do this and spend money there, we do it as a collective need. Transport fits into that collective need. There are buses that do go empty. There are buses that are full. And those peak hour buses are really full. There are other services that aren't as full. But the quantitative or the total figure when we balance I and mean, when we have balance and checks, the total figure isn't bad. Now what is being offered here 
is the selling off of our own assets. And what it will do is it will create mass unemployment and a decrease in services. Now we talk about COVID-19 and I wrote a story, an article, a letter to a friend and I said, we have to be cautious with all this stuff about you know, opening borders and stopping isolation. And I said, if COVID-19 is the enemy, then uh, if we break all these things down, what it means is that if we're complacent, complacency is its ally. Now, I know I'm maybe pulling a long bow, but if privatization is the enemy of the people, and it is, because it takes away a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunities, and it might hurt some people as I say it, but then this liberal government is its ally. Because what happens is the government of the day who promised, as was stated by our union representatives, and thank God we have a union movement, that they made a promise that privatization would stop. There was a line in the sand and they got elected, but now they have to keep in mind the promises they make. I often quote the union song, and I'll say it again today before I sit down. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. What weaker force on earth than the feeble power of one? The union makes us strong. Now the pendulum of time does swing. Let's go back to the days when we go back to the industrial revolution, when the workers' rights were compromised and uh, their st work standards and safety were compromised. The unions stood up for the workers. And they got us in Australia, that eight hour work, eight hour play, eight hours a day. These were hard fought victories, which we now take for granted. But now, with this COVID-19 and our jobs are under threat, and believe me, we've had a health challenge. We're gonna have an economical challenge soon. That's when you're gonna value the union movement because they're the only safety net we have in this greedy society. They're the only people who are gonna stand up for the workers. And this privatization which is occurring in the bus services is just the start. If we don't act now and we don't show some leadership on this issue, we will lose, we lost the bank, the Commonwealth Bank, we lost Qantas, we, we, I can go on and on and on. But as I end the way I started, give me one good example of successful privatization and I will support this. I'm still scratching my head thinking, one good example. I talk about Thatcherism and the Iron Lady and we talk about all those things in Britain that made the difference. But what did it do to their society? What did it do to those communities? I tell you, what it led to a dysfunctional community and there's the, the do's and the don'ts or the people that have and the have nots. And that doesn't lead to that sense of community that we're so proud of in the city. I hope, and I thank Councillor Luxford and Councillor former Mayor Shuri for bringing this to our attention. They're from two different parts of the political spectrum, but they care about their community. This isn't about politics, this is about community. And we should put an end to this privatization the same way it'll put an end to our sense of community and even the fabric that binds our community together. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I won't be supporting this motion. There are too many things wrong in this motion for me. Um, one of the things is the fact that the facts are removed. Buses are being franchised. The depots will be owned by the government. The buses will be owned by the government. When the car government brought this in in 2004, they created private contracts. They tendered the management of the bus services out. Then in 2005, they did a 
uh, a much smarter thing, and that is they built into the contracts that for every new bus that was to be built, it would be owned by the government. So when a service provider folded because they couldn't cope with the expectations of their um, of the government and of the people using those services, they left with old buses, and the new buses stayed with the government. So. It, you know, as I said, it's a smart thing to bring in, and when the O'Farrell government came in, they continued the practice. So to th since 2011, the um, existing government have continued to franchise the services. Because what we don't realise is that governments shouldn't have to manage every single thing. They shouldn't have to manage, um, you know, all services. They already have the infrastructure in place, so they have the depots, they have the ability to hold on to that land, they have the ability to hold on to the, um, you know, the buses and other aspects, but the management of those services can be outsourced, and it has been already outsourced to nearly all bus services, bus regions, I should say, across New South Wales. So these last few regions that will be uh, franchised is, it's nothing new. This has been happening for long enough. And the other thing that I wanted to also point out that the government is working towards zero emissions. This is a standard. This is something that's expected in the in um, our society right now. That when we do um, start to move forward in in technology, when it comes to our buses and our trains and our light rail, uh, or I should yeah, light rail. Um, that we expect zero emissions. So the buses, the diesel buses, will be entirely um, rolled over to electric buses in the future. And this is something that I think we should also consider. Now, when it comes to the bus drivers' employment, so the existing arrangements stay in place for 18 months, as we know, and the bus drivers themselves can be contracted for another two years. In a lot of people's terms, that's job security. And it's unfortunate to say that a two-year contract is job security, but unfortunately it is. It's, uh, it's happened before COVID, it's happened right now, and it will happen in the future that people will lose jobs and they won't get them back. And it can be because of technology, it can be because of people working from home and not taking public transport as much as they used to, but these uh, the, you know, the fast moving changes that we are getting used to or have to get used to, unfortunately. So the two year contract, the continuation and, and possible continuation of further contracts for bus drivers is a reality. And as I said, that's called job security. Um, so looking at what the, the motions are actually asking for, I think that they're unrealistic. You can't say that um, the provider or any provider or the government, in fact, can make assurances that bus stops will not move, um, services will not change because they need to change, bus lines need to move, and it all comes down to the people who use it. If it's not being used, then bus services do stop. Um, I take public transport when I do go to work. I haven't been to work for three months. Um, I've been working from home every day, but. I took the X73 and the 373 every single day in and out of work and I love the bus service. I love the bus, it's fine. It, it, it's nothing wrong with it. Um, but I think that one of the, the things that we should keep in the front of our mind is that this is a franchise situation and it's very similar to a pub. If I have the money, I could go buy the land and build a pub, but if I can't manage it and I don't know how to, uh, you know, how to select boutique beer, I would outsource that service and I would get someone who's more experienced to come in and run my pub for me. This is a much larger scale with a bigger impact on our community, but as I said, it's not the privatisation, it's a bus franchise. So I won't be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Robert. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I'll be brief. I'm sure uh, the numbers are there for the for this motion. Uh, I note this, this motion that was uh, up in previous, uh, previous meetings as well. Uh, they seem to be very similar. We seem to have a motion about this month after month and frankly I'm quite surprised that it's in order uh, because we've already covered this in multiple previous meetings. Now I'd just like to quickly say that uh, I've got all the time in the world for all transport workers, bus drivers, 
plane drivers. Uh, I'm a pilot myself previously, uh, and I thank them for the work and services that they do for our community. Uh, but the priority of a government is to maximise the quality of services that it delivers to the community. That's what I think the, the priority of a government should be. Now, to do that, we need a responsive bus service that puts the community first. Now, let's get to the, let's get to the, to the truth of the matter. We've heard a lot of emotive statements tonight that I have major concerns about. So let's look at the truth. Let's look at the data. Councillor D'Souza asked for an example. Well, let's look at the Inner West contract that started in 2018 and the data that's come out of that, including an Auditor General's report. Since 2018 in the Inner West, it has, the time limit, timeliness has improved. The patronage growth grew faster once that, once that contract was signed with that, franchise, with that franchise operator. The patronage grew faster than the patronage growth before. The service standards were better than before. And in fact, since the patronage grew, how could services have been cut if more people are using it? So the truth of the matter is that it was a success in the inner west if we're looking to find out what actually is happening here. The Auditor General report also went on to say that the contract system is providing better services to the community, higher customer satisfaction ratings than for the previous period under the, under the public system, and more time on, more time limit, timeliness uh, performance. And at the same time, the government is saving $100 million per year so it is also operating more efficiently. So that is the facts, that's the data. The Auditor General is an independent body. Now with regard to jobs, the operator of this franchise will need bus drivers, preferably with prior experience. The suggestion that they will lose their jobs is, is completely wrong and uh, should be disregarded, councillors. Now frankly, if you're a bad bus driver, you certainly will, should be required to get better. Now, with regard to the contracts, the Auditor General also says that there's a fundamental conflict of interest with the contract with the STA because it's the Transport for New South Wales putting out a contract for a service to itself to then deliver that service. It says that the contractor approach is, is justified. It says there's no clear delineation between the purchaser and provider. Now, with regard to choice, in, uh, in our area, choice will be maintained. I'm confident under the new changes. I'm grateful that the government has invested $2 billion in a light rail, and I think it's fantastic. And it should be extended further into the city. And now we're having integrated bus system, the fact of the matter is we will retain services, we will retain capacity to get around our, our area. I am quite comfortable with the changes that our choices to get around will be maintained. So that's the truth. It will not be the end of the world under this new system. It will not be the end of jobs and frankly I will not be supporting this motion. Councillor Andrews. Yes, um, thanks Mr Mayor. Look, I'm going to um, support the motion of um, Councillor Luxford and um, Shuri tonight because privatisation is not the way to go in relation to our buses and you know we, we talk about privatisation and Councillor Roberts talks about the benefits and, and the strengths of privatisation by this, um, by this state government. Well, let's look at the Northern Beaches Hospital. This state government recently privatised Northern Beaches Hospital and, and guess what? It's been a disaster. Northern Beaches Hospital, you know, there's no food for patients, there's, there's been no water for patients, hospital lists, emergency lists have gone through the roof. This is what privatisation does. And our essential services, such as transport, need to remain in public hands. You know, this area needs um, public transport, good public transport, which we've got at the moment. Privatisation will, will have the effect, as it's having on Northern Beaches Hospital. Services will drop, um, our bus service in this area and will be affected. Fares will go up and our community does not want that. So I'm going to support the motion um, put forward by Councillor Luxford and I congratulate Councillor Luxford for putting this forward um, because our community 
does not want privatisation of our bus service. Councillor de Rocha and then Councillor Beach. Um, I just want to know how much are we going to privatise or sell off before there's nothing left? Um, I really do believe that um, our buses, the minute that they leave public hands is the minute that everything starts falling apart and, you know, there's no guarantees on, on, on cost, there's no guarantees on job security and I get what um, um, Councillor Christie said in regards to two years may seem you know, to be secure to some, but um, I've been a local government for 34 years, um, so I know people that drive buses that have been there for 30, so two years is not a long term, um, regardless of what moment we're in. I think protecting jobs, pro keeping this in public hands is a must. Councillor Beach. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and I do commend this uh, wonderful motion. Uh, one thing that always amuses me is to find uh, certain colleagues uh, in this chamber who uh, continuously uh, attack uh, councillors who are in favour of keeping public services in public hands because ultimately it is showing a lack of faith in the ability of their own government to actually manage our public services. I would actually support everyone in this chamber or in this room to get behind this motion and actually show some confidence in the ability of our public servants who are doing a fantastic job to perform the duties uh, to which, uh, which we all pay as taxpayers. When you get up and say, we don't, we, there are people in this room who are actually absurdly saying, we don't think our government or our public servants uh, are capable of running a public service uh, that benefits our community. It, it's absolutely ridiculous. So the, uh, some of the arguments that are being uh, put up tonight are in actual fact just utterly ludicrous. At a time like this, we should be uh, building up our public service, increasing jobs. These are secure jobs. They should be secure jobs. Um, and we should be rolling them out um, across all levels. We need to retain these really precious uh, public transport systems for, for our kids, for all of us. We all, we all use our buses, um, and that's the main form of public transport used in, in the eastern suburbs and in our LGA. So I hope we can uh, support, continue to support this campaign I don't care if it comes up at every council meeting. Let's let's keep up the work um, and, and and get behind and make sure because once this has, if it does get sold off, that that that'll be it. Um, so we have to keep up this fight as much as possible. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I probably should have signed a declaration of um, interest because I'm a very proud owner of a senior's Opal card <laughs> and as a, as a retiree. Um, I, I just think that it's a no-brainer. Public transport should be just that. It should be public owned in public hands. And we know that privatisation doesn't work. It's been a disaster in most places that anything... I'm just thinking of England, you know, with Mr Branson taking over the trains, and, you know, that didn't work at all. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's public transport should be just that. And I never thought Councillor Andrews and I would agree on something. Mr. Venos. Mr. Mayor, I find it very amusing that um, here in New South Wales, we're the only state in Australia that still hasn't privatised its bus services. Every state across Australia, whether we talk about Victoria, whether we talk about South Australia, whether we talk about Queensland, whether we talk about Western Australia, all other states, whether they've been Labor or Liberal, have privatised their bus services. Yet here in New South Wales, we continue to lag behind. Now, I've heard so many arguments tonight, but I thought I'd put my final boot in right now because I think now's the time for me to talk. Now, over the last 20 years in Victoria, 
They've saved $1.3 billion by having privatised their bus services. And where do you think they invested that money? They put it back into new trams and an electric bus service. Now, I remember a councillor getting up in this chamber talking to us about going green and having electric bus service, buses. You know, I can tell you, Mr Mayor, an electric bus costs $850,000 and the maintenance involved in maintaining those buses is exorbitant, exorbitant. But at the end of the day, if we're going to go ahead with doing that and going green and having zero emissions, there is no way that the public sector can afford to do that. A government can't afford to do that. They just could not afford to do it, especially now at this time. Now, I'm not going to tell you that by privatising the actual services, they will be able to afford to do it. The $1.3 billion in savings that the Victorian government has had over the last 20 years has gone back directly back in a public transport. Now, we had the Speaker get up earlier tonight and he said that uh, currently the uh, on-time rate for buses is 87 per cent. Yet this motion is talking about 95 per cent or better. Really? You've got it at 87 per cent now and you're, you're criticising uh, you're, you're asking for 95 per cent, something better than what you've currently got now? Is that what it's all about? Come on. And then the next argument they put up was something about job security. Two years job security. Well, I could tell you, as someone who's worked in the private sector, an employer myself, I don't know anybody in the private sector that's ever been guaranteed any sort of job security at all. Two years after, after the services are privatised, for me, that's enough time for you to go and get another job or to find a job. So I'm sorry, I'm going to go along with whatever Christy Hamilton said, and Councillor Hamilton and Councillor Roberts. I agree pure heartedly with this. We're the only state in Australia that hasn't done it, and I think we should be doing it now. If there's savings to be made and money to be reinvested in public transport, let's do it. Phil Bowen. Uh, I'll be supporting the motion. I think it's an excellent motion, and uh, I congratulate the authors and I thank the representatives of the, um, the workers for coming along and uh, giving us um, their take on what's proposed. Um, just a couple of very quick points. Uh, Councillor Stavrinos is a, uh, an accountant and, uh, and he understands figures and I was listening intently to the $1.2 billion saving that uh, the Victorian government has had over 20 years. And of course, I thought of another figure of $3 billion or cost of light rail, uh, but let's not quibble about that. We'll just say what the additional cost, which is 1.5 billion, has been. Uh, so that's been spent on public transport for a net loss. Um, and I might add, uh, uh, so I just just remind Council Stavrinas for that. Um, <laughs> I know he likes it. He, he likes a good set of figures. Uh, so, but seriously. I mean, our community has suffered enough. They're not silly. It's no accident that they um, decided that a change was needed in the state seat of Coogee as to what they've witnessed in this area. And here we go again. We've had this debacle of light rail, uh, an absolute extortionate cost, uh, exorbitant cost, sorry. Um, and now we're looking at privatisation. And it's interesting listening to Councillor Hamilton talk about the fact that um, the buses themselves are not to be sold. Well, if that's the case, uh, and it may well be the case, I don't profess to be an expert in this area, well, where are the savings then? If, if it's, if, where's the efficiencies? Where's the gain to create profitability? It has to be in relation to cuts to the workforce and cuts to services. Um, so our buses are very valued. Councillor Parker um, is correct. The, bu the, bus is, the bus service is superior. It's just a fact. And um, that's sought to be cut. The public asset is to be cut or privatised, and of course, light rail is privatised. So, I think we need to stand up for our community. Our community are not silly. They've they've already uh, given a warning to the government on this uh, by what happened in the state seat of Coogee at the last election, and that will be there'll be more to come if um, the essential services of our uh, state are to be looked at as assets to be sold off. And one final point, I think we should all extend our appreciation to those workers, transport workers, who have had to keep working during the pandemic and putting themselves and their families at risk uh, during the past few months. Yeah, so I think we just need to acknowledge that as well. Thank you. Councillor Luxford, do you want to wrap it up? OK, 
Okay, so we've heard a lot from everyone here tonight. So uh, just to, to wrap this up, the 87% that Councillor Stavrinos was referring to is actually in Newcastle where the buses have been privatised. So the state transit buses are running at a much better rate than the 87% that um, is being provided by the, the franchise bunch. Patronage has increased in Region 6 due to, due to community growth and services have, um, have grown as well because people now have to take more than one bus to get to where they're going. So they have to change buses. So there have been, you know, services have grown, but it's not efficient for the people who are actually having to jump on and off buses to get where they're going. Um, one bus got you into the city. One bus now only gets you either to a train station, nowhere near where you want to go, or to a light rail stop, or to another bus stop where you have to get off and change and keep going. Um, State Transit is actually performing better than the KPIs um, of the privatised bus services. We don't want to be like any other state. We are New South Wales. We are our own state. Why do we need to follow on of what everyone else is doing? Um, I urge the councillors here tonight to support this motion. For those of you who haven't signed the pledge to keep our buses public, I also urge you to do so. And I urge you to follow the Region 9 campaign meetings that are occurring weekly. We need to save our buses, we need to keep our buses public and we need to keep services within our community and care for the people that we actually represent. So councillors, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. I declare that carried. Um, a division? Please raise your right hand, all those in favour. Councillor Shuri, Councillor Nielsen, Councillor Veach, Councillor Luxford, Councillor Parker, Councillor Singh, Councillor Andrews, Councillor Bowen, Councillor Matson, Councillor De Rocha, Councillor De Souza, and the Mayor, all those against. Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Stavrinos, and Councillor Roberts. So again, I declare that carried.